Do you really know what to do in times of crisis? Do you know what to do if you may be caught in a fire? If you maybe are in a situation of war? Or maybe if there's a flood? Well, definitely this is one of the reasons we're holding this webinar. But don't forget that we also want to help others. So this will be another very important topic we'll talk about because in the end, if you have the knowledge, you're less fearful and you'll be strong. So welcome to this webinar. My name is Thomas Binder. Um, the company that um, I founded is 123 Sonography, which is an educational company in el ultimately. And actually, we've done these type of webinars in the past. Uh, two years ago, we sat here and we presented the topic of COVID-19. We have a very, very distinguished panel and speakers with us. Let me introduce you very shortly. To the left of me, I have Katrin Birnat, who is the CEO of 123 Sonography. And she also has a lot to say about self-defense, as you will hear later. And then, of course, we have um, Sascha Baumeister, who will then uh, be introduced in much more detail uh, when we come to his first talk. We've got Dr. Kwaresh, uh, Tal Kwaresh, who is um, also online. We will have him in the call, in the, in the talk a little bit later. To the right, we have Alexander Nuremberger, who is from the Medical University of Vienna. He is an expert in the field of emergency medicine, and he's also the one who coordinates uh, catastrophes um, in a tertiary center, such as the Medical University of Vienna. Then we have to the left, uh, Ben Tal, who is uh, also an emergency doctor. He works for the Austrian Ambulance, so he have a lot to say about what you need to know in an acute situation. And then we have Gerold Porenta, who will hear later. He'll talk about radiation, a very important topic, especially uh, since uh, many of us maybe live in close vicinity to a nuclear power plant. But enough introduction. Let me just hand it over to Katrin quickly and uh, give her the word. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thanks, everybody. And we are really happy to host this webinar. Um, maybe in um, first to clarify some terms uh, for people who are not aware with all the terminology, you will hear the term Krav Maga a lot. Yeah. Uh, what does Krav Maga mean? It is an Israeli-based ba self-defense system with several pillars. Um, some are for private persons and civilians. Other is security as, um, and police. And the third one is for military. Um, it was founded by Central Eastern European founder Emil Lichtenfels, uh, Lichtenfeld, who then emigrated to Israel in the Second World War and started teaching it from there. Yeah. And it is a very modern um, system. The speakers we have today are coming from a global organization called Krav Maga Global, which is one of the biggest entities with about 60 subsidiaries all, all over the world. Um, yeah, and uh, headed by Eyal, who was a direct um, pupil of EB. Yeah. Um, and at this point, I'm very happy to introduce our first speaker already, Sascha Baumeister. Um, he is an entrepreneur in the field of uh, private security with several um, years of international experience. And he's also a KMG, Krav Maga Global self-defense instructor with four schools in Germany, yeah, training civilians as well as public authorities and security companies. Um, additionally, he's also on the board of German directors, um, and he's an expert three, which is something like a very high black level, uh, black belt, sorry. Hi, Sasha. Happy to have you here. Uh, just uh, before we uh, get going, I need to give you a little bit of instructions because you can actually ask questions. So please, please ask questions. We will try to answer them. So we will have, of course, keynotes presentations, but we'll also have uh, a discussion, a very lively discussion with questions that you might have. And one last thing before we get going, this webinar is, of course, with Krav Maga experts and with medical experts, but it is for everyone. It's for everyone out there who definitely needs to know more or wants to know more about uh, the issues of civil defense. Okay, let's get going. Hello? You hear me? Hi, Sasha. We hear you well. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, thank you for the invitation and also for the friendly introduction. I also want to say sorry in the beginning for my bumpy English because of uh, two years staying in Germany and having not so much contact to the other people in the world. Never mind, we've heard actually that the German accent uh, sounds really nice. So go ahead. Okay. 
<laughs> okay, I already start my um, presentation, yes? Yes, please. One second. So you hear it, or you see it, especially? Okay, so today I talk about uh, civil protection in time of crisis, and I have divided um, my presentation in two major parts. First is a little bit of theoretical, giving tools, giving information, and the second is a little bit more in details of uh, some situation that could, could be possible, okay? So I start with the, from my point of view, biggest or a very big um, issue is the mindset. So mindset means um, the, per, the possibility to deal with problems and also challenges of every kind. Must, must be some, some dangerous stuff, could also be the problems in life, yes? And uh, security, Um, sorry again, you hear me because I get a question now. Uh, you can hear me all? Yeah, yeah, all is good. We can hear you we very can hear you. Okay. clearly. Okay, perfect. Okay, security is a matter of attitude and the question of using the right tools. And this is what I want to give to you now. So talking about tools. And first of all, the tools is the situational awareness. My point of view, very important. So start with be aware of your surroundings open eyes, walking with open eyes, looking to people, looking to things, taking control. The next thing is know and feeling the baseline. So every place, doesn't matter if it's uh, known or unknown, have a special feeling, special baseline, and it's important to, to know this. Or if you don't know it, to feel, is everything is okay, or is some problems there. And third, and yeah, or well, last but not least, trust your instinct. Um, in the, the last years, I think we, we lost the, the feeling and the trusting in the instincts, and we have to get a little bit more trust in this. So instinct can save lives. So to make this a little bit more predictable, we have a risk formula, and this means that the risk equals threat multiplied vulnerability divided by resources. Let's talk a lot, this a little bit. Um, we have influence on two of this stuff, with the vulnerability and the resources. The vulnerability, which describes suspectability of people, organizations, and things by harmful influences, attacks, or damage. And uh, it's important to lower this, yes? And the resources are preparation for possible situation, if we can, raise the resources. So low risk, high security. Uh, another important tool for this is the Cooper color code. I will fill it a little bit with some easy examples. So uh, we have in, in this, this variation, we have four, four colors. It's the first is the white, is unaware. For example, I'm sitting in my home, closed doors, closed windows and my guard dog beside me. So I'm unaware of the situation, totally relaxed. So next is the yellow, the aware. So if I leave my home, I'm looking what's happening there. I'm still a little bit of relaxed, but I'm taking care of the situation. I'm looking what's happening. Next one will be alert, orange. So for example, if I go to my car and there's standing somebody um, I getting in focus on this person. So it doesn't belong to the situation. It's, uh, I don't know him. So I go in the orange mode, I focus on him. And the last one is the red alarm. So let's say he's attacking me, he's approaching me. So I have to decide what to do. I go into action. With this four, four um, colors, we can yeah, simply use for, for many situations in life. Next tool, these are still tools, is the ODA loop. 
meaning observe, so taking care of something, collecting information. Next one is orient, uh, perceive situations, what's happening there. Next one is decide, so it's easy. I prescribe the situation and then decide what to do. And in the end, I act. And this is a loop, so it returns every time. Yeah? And improves the decision-making progress or the process uh, very easy. So it's, it's very important for, for, let's say, not to freeze when something happens what is uh, not predictable for me. So the next is a little bit more practical. I decided to take three characters of crisis. First of all, the natural disasters like um, earthquake, flooding. Next one's an accident like plane crash. And the third one is armed conflicts, war, civil war, civil unrest, or active shooter situation. Let's say, let's look in the personal situation of everybody, which kind of crisis is most relevant for you. So you have to think about what can happen to me. If I'm living in an area like, like myself, we have uh, last summer, we have the flood, flooding here. I live very high. I only have a blackout for a few days. Yes, but think about what could happen in, in the place where I live or in the place where I have to go. And when you have some points to consider, create a plan and a checklist for time of crisis, meaning in advance, before, not in the moment. When, when, I, when something happens to me and I didn't uh, thought this could happen, it's very, very hard to, to um, go with this. Good. And uh, in, in the description of the webinar, we say you get 10 points from me. Now the 10 points. First of all, important documents. So meaning certificate of birth, something about your house, something about the wedding, something about uh, the cars. Have a hard copy and also the information of a USB stick. And um, also important in my, my point of view is uh, pictures of your kids and the family. So you have something to remember when everything is lost. Okay, next one, if you have to stay at home, it doesn't, there are situations where you have to stay at home and situations where you have to go. If you have to stay at home, take care of water, food, heat, etc. And I think Catherine will do something in the, one of the following presentation about this very deep. So it's, it's enough for yes, now. And if you have evacuate from home, so you leave your home, um, you already have the checklist, uh, take care of your car in advance. So let's say a half full tank, it's an empty tank. Uh, take care of the tires, take care of everything you have to take with you in advance. And also think about some alternative escape routes. So if one route is closed, take another one. So now come a little bit from the Kraft Maga point of view, training. Train everything what you think you have to do. Train with your kids to leave the house. Train kid one have to take care of kid two. Kid three have to take care of the turtles of the house or whatever. So that for most of all, it makes fun when you do it in, in good times, but in bad times, you, you will be happy if you have trained. If you have to go to foreign countries also in advance, Look for trustworthy locals there. Yeah? Also if you have to leave Germany and have to go to another country, for example, last week we go to Poland, we have some, somebody there who was local who can give us the information we need, very easy and also trustworthy. Now go to what to do a little bit, it's only, only a little bit into, into natural disasters. Um, I want to say now first is um, the internet is an awesome source of information. So you can in, find in the um, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs or civil protection agencies, you get very good information what to do. I'm collecting a little bit like an earthquake. If you have to leave the building 
only when it's safe outside. So nothing can fall down on you, then you can leave the building. Yeah. If, if it's not possible to leave the building, you have to stay in there, stay under door frames or solid tables, for example, so that also nothing can fall on you. Flooding is another one what happened, it's relevant for me, so I take it. Flooding, it's do not enter basements, very dangerous, and also underground car parks are very dangerous. We have some um, losses here in my area for people that went into the, their basements, yes, in the summer time. Next one is plane crash. In case of a plane crash, uh, the first part of this right closing is uh, what you couldn't do in advance, but you can everything and do in advance. Plate closing means wearing long, long trousers, solid shoes, long sleeve like shirts yeah, to protect the body. If it's cotton, it's also not so fast burning than other, and it's giving you heat when you have to go in the go outside. <clears throat> Sitting close to the corridor and also close to the emergency exits improves and raises the possibility to survive a plane crash. Okay. And it's also more or less important for every situation, stay calm and considered. Try to stay calm, breathing, try to stay considered. Next one, active shooter, so time of war. Now I take the active shooter situation. Um, I want to talk about with you about the difference between cover and concealment. First cover. The engine side of a car is a trunk is a, of, a, of a car is a cover and also in concealment. If you go to the trunk side of the car, it's only concealment. So first of all, engine side of car, you're a little bit protective from, from its, let's say bullets, and also not seen from the, the attacker, the active shooter. When you take the trunk side of the car, there's not so much protection for bullets, but it's still concealment. He cannot see you. Kidnapping, hostage taking, also for most of all for people to go to foreign countries. First of all, the same like the plane crash, they're calm and considered. Second, look also for other people that they stay calm. Yes, calm others down. Try in the beginning of the event not to attract too much attention on you. Yeah, try to be a gray man, try to be one of the group. Later stage, it's sometimes better to create a personal bond to the people, to the hostage taker or the kidnapper. It could help for the later part of the event. So I'm running through it. Um, somebody has questions. Well, Sasha, first of all, thank you for this really, really important overview. There's so much information in here. Uh, I think there's uh, much more we need to discuss about these topics. Um, the first question I have, or actually I want to uh, just point to a book. Maybe we can show that my slide to the audience here. This is a book I came across just recently, and I want to just uh, ask you if you see it the same way, because the author actually says that there's different types of people and that their behavior plays a huge role in whether or not they are survivors or not. And uh, he says there is a, something like an 80-10-10 rule where most of the people start to freeze. They're statuesque. And then you would have 10% of people who start to panic, uh, and then you've got 10% who are really alert and who actually uh, present themselves just as you said we should. Uh, what is your take on this? Is that your personal experience as well? Yes, it's my personal experience, and it's everything about the mindset. My point of view is the mindset. So if I'm thinking the way, so problem, problem solution, this is the way to think, the mindset, um, and also the training. It's very important. So if a friend of mine say, if you look to uh, many times the movie Rambo, you get a little bit like Rambo. Um, we, we always laugh about this, but it's a little bit true. If I think about situation, I can prepare for this. So if somebody, some situation hits me by surprise, it's very hard to react. So basically you would say we should start watching uh, catastrophe movies or movies where we see all sorts of different catastrophes because they prepare us in a certain way. No, I think the movies are still movies and it's not so good the, um, the preparation for real events. Yeah, I mean, if 
more or less uh, like if I think about situations and I, I read articles about situations, real articles, then I can better prepare for real life. Let me just pitch a question to Ben. Uh, ben, uh, you of course see a lot of people out in the field. Um, and for me the question is, how do people uh, that uh, are confronted with catastrophes react? Uh, do you see more people that are kind of, um, I would say, um, under control or is panic a big issue in the field? Well, I think the big panic reaction that we, that we normally have seen in movies is, is something that belongs to the movies. I think most of the people facing catastrophes in the primary phase, they are pretty much stunned and standing there and trying to, to realize what is happening. And it's sometimes pretty difficult to see what's going on inside of them. So, so it's the statuesque people, right? Yeah. And how do you get people moving then? By telling them. By telling them. <laughs> okay. Good. It's as easy as it gets, yeah. yeah. By telling them, by maybe touching their arm and mm -hmm. just point them to a direction, or ask them politely, but uh, just ask them what, what you want them to do. Yeah. Is that something you can train, Sasha? Um, good short um, break. Um, if I, I heard from people that uh, freeze, that they say it was like watching a movie. So everything a little bit slower, and it's watching a movie, and I see myself. This was what they say to me when when they have situation to freeze. Doesn't matter of fighting or, or some some kind of accident, and uh, giving orders. It's something very good. So giving you do this, you do this. Please go there. So giving clear orders helps in this situation a very lot, and yes, it could be trained. Yeah, I think what we see a lot, especially with your schools as well, is uh, that people really directly talk to a certain person going from, hey, you in the green T-shirt, do that, and the other one calls the police, right? So what I understood, you actually do scenario training like this also with your students. Simulations is a very, very big topic to, to train. So from, from start with principles or with techniques, then go to principles and put this in some kind of real-life situation as close as possible to, to real life. So with safe, safe environment, but close to it. It's completely different than training. It's like in the first aid courses. If you do only the training first aid, it's different than you get a little bit of simulation of, of this stuff. I mean, Alexander, maybe I just ask you a question since you see a lot of patients coming in, you see a lot of emergency situations. Um, we as medical doctors, of course, are trained, but when you start uh, your medical training, uh, we sometimes uh, are in a situation very similar. Uh, at least I've seen a lot of students or young doctors not knowing what to do. Yes, absolutely. That's a an, that's an very important part of training, of course, as well. Um, it's what described I, I saw a CRM training video a short time ago and what is described for pilots as partial incapacitation and that's something that can happen that if you're overwhelmed with what is happening yeah, and you don't you lose control you know that uh, losing it and losing the grip on it you just freeze and par partially or totally and it's very very different difficult also for the team to realize this because you may be acting something but it's you're not act you're not not acting to what is needed and so that's very important first of all for as a supervisors for training to um, prepare them on the situations by training and then by supervising in these situations so that first of all maybe we can avoid these situations or if they occur that we can help them out and the patient of course. Of course we use simulator training a lot in medicine as well and I think as a matter of fact um, I wish it would be more because actually I always have the impression that the flight industry uh, and pilots are trained uh, much more in simulators. Maybe, Ty, uh, can you give us uh, your take on this? I mean, you've been in situations. Um, what is your take on this issue of how can we pre 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 um, prepare for alertness? Ty, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, so, can everybody can hear me? Yes. Yes. Good evening. <laughs> uh, so, uh, first of all, uh, the major point of the uh, awareness is the training. There's nothing that can replace it. Um, you can talk a lot about the theory, but uh, as everything during the conflict or war, you can uh, call it whatever you want, is basically uh, whatever you're planning is going to go exactly the opposite way. 
So uh, one of the things that I can tell you that uh, it is possible uh, sometimes maybe to make an uh, attempt uh, to try yourself in a new field of medicine. So if I'm talking about the med uh, medical stuff, I'm not talking about the civilians. Um, so uh, today, except especially the Western medicine is really localized to the specific uh, uh, subject or specific field. And then it happened the situation when the war is coming, the doctors actually being asked to do things which they, for years, maybe never, never practiced or never practiced at all. And this creating a lot of uh, stress because uh, I think that one of the major things uh, which related to the doctor's job, that they differently from civilians are being actually expected to lead, not to hide and do their job the best way possible. Um, and of course, it's creating the issue that uh, in the stressful situation, we find ourselves uh, unprepared. So if to take an example, for example, my experience with the uh, Israeli military, uh, I don't know if you're aware, but every male soldier uh, after finishing the military doing the reserve service, and in the moment he becomes a medical doctor, immediately integrated into the military as a part of the medical corps. And performing basically the training and the preparation for uh, conflict activity about 30 to 45 days a year. And the training specifically designed for uh, preparing himself for the battle. Uh, maybe you lead me with the next question so I will be more uh, point-like with answers. Okay, thank you very much. I think uh, there's so many open uh, questions, of course. Uh, again, if you have questions, uh, if they're coming in, I'm happy to answer them. Um, so we just got a question uh, again about uh, the USB stick and um, uh, the question was how, how do you have that available? Where do you put that? Do you carry that along with you all the time? Uh, I guess you're muted. Yes, so yeah. no. Yes, I have it with me. Yeah. So you just simply wear it on your keychain and you always have it there? Yes. Yeah. No, I think this is definitely something that I can only agree on. I learned that here as well. Uh, you know, you don't think about these things and you don't have much to take with you. I mean, when we look at, for example, the people coming uh, to the refugee camps, they usually only have a bag or a little, very little with you. Uh, I mean, um, Sasha, you've been in the region of the Ukraine and you've delivered uh, goods there. Can you just maybe describe some of your impressions and, and uh, what is really important to them when they come? Yeah, um, not so much because uh, we have, uh, before we have contact with trustworthy locals and from, from Ukraine and giving the stuff to them and they brought it. So we don't have too much contact with um, refugees there. So we will drive next week and then uh, we have a little bit more information about this. So Maybe. at the moment, it's very hard. They, are, they have some kind of... Uh, refugee camps on the Polish border and from there they send it to different countries. But what kind of um, goods would they need or what uh, is something that you can supply them with which uh, that they don't have now that they left home? Okay, and our first mission was to bring uh, stuff for babies. So this, uh, this goes to in the Ukraine in uh, child hospital, hospitals. So this is what we delivered first, and the second it will be medical stuff for the soldiers. So, and to your question, um, they need everything. Yeah. They need clothing, they need uh, a place to stay, a safe place to stay for ex foremost. They have nothing, they have a small bag with them. I mean, now going back to a little bit another topic, another question, which is um, we had the topic with freezing easily. Is there any good tip you would give beginners or anybody in their daily life on how to overcome this freezing and how to react more quickly? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very different or difficult question, but um, I have the experience that if you do something, if you, also for freezing, for example, we already heard it. It's not freezing and standing like this. Freezing could be a loop that somebody repeats a specific move every time. Yeah, he walks, he's still walking, he's still speaking. And um, for, for others, it's a little bit easier to get him out there. For myself, 
if I do two moves, two moves, it could be possible to, to break the freezing. So like, it, it's still training, it's still in the training. Uh, one final question, which always comes to my mind, and I think uh, you've heard situations um, where there is a mass panic. Um, I just looked up in the internet, the largest mass panic, you must imagine, was actually during the Second World War in China, where there was an air raid and uh, people were in a shelter, and um, the air raid was over, and they ran out, but then the sirens again uh, were on, and the people tried to get back in. And th there was about 4,000 people killed. So uh, these situations do happen. And um, you have your experiences on how this can be prevented or what should we know about this? It's, it's very difficult. And it's um, all in the, in the end, it's trusting your instincts. So um, I heard today, I heard something in the radio from 9-11 from that uh, the people were told to stay in the, in the, in the towers, to stay where they are. And uh, some of the people trust their instinct and leave, and this is the most of them still living. So it's it's hard to say, but it's it's much of instinct. But I guess the bottom line is try to avoid uh, such situations where you see lots of masses together. And I would assume that there are special plans for organizers that uh, try to avoid and have uh, flight routes so that it just doesn't occur in the first place, right? Yes, of course, you have to, to, to make plans, but like Tal said before, um, every plan um, getting problems when you have uh, first contact with the enemy. So to, to make a place big enough to take care of uh, signs that people see where they have to go. Um, but also every emergency has different rules. So if I have some places where people could collect when there's a fire. So we have an outside security area or meeting room for them. If this is an active shooter event, it's very hard because the people don't have to go there where the active shooter could be. So it's, it's every situation is different. Uh, yeah, many thanks for your inputs. Um, um, yeah, and uh, also for your insights. And uh, there will be certainly within this uh, live stream also even more questions to come. Um, yeah, and I'm also happy to contribute a little bit to this topic myself, um, because basically um, at Krav uh, Maga Academy we are also frequently uh, asked on how to prepare for crisis at home in a safe region and also what to store. So to start off, there's just a small game or thought for you, you can also comment, uh, which is when you think of storing for crisis, yeah, um, what comes to your mind? What do you want to have in your basement or somewhere in, in a room you uh, consider as a um, safe place? Uh, I guess you can post in your chat, right? You can post in a chat, but uh, maybe also the experts can give one or two hints. Just one word. A bag. A suitable bag for a long traveling. Okay. Small words. Sorry. Water. What? And you? Well, if I observe what is happening, toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, well, uh, those are good guesses, and uh, some are really uh, covering the most important topic. Um, can I get the presentation? Yeah. Please? Sorry. Hmm. Yeah, this is definitely something that is, um, you know, on the mind of everyone. It's always the question: What should you have at home? Uh, so I'm really, really curious to find out what um, what it actually is. So I'll just hand over the presentation now to Katrin. Great. Um, actually, uh, what we tend to apply is the rule of three, um, which is smart priority setting in when it comes to uh, stay safe and also to stock up things. Yeah? Um, basically, it says you can live three seconds without attention. This is what Sasha was in force, uh, was um, uh, uh, not enforcing, was mentioning, mentioning uh, with an intensity, for instance, with the Cooper color code. So basically to stay safe, an easy way to stay safe in the first place in any kind of uh, situation is don't be a zombie. Uh, be aware of your surrounding. Uh, the second thing is three minutes without oxygen. Huh? Um, then you can survive approximately three hours on the extreme conditions such as cold or heat. Um, we're really talking about extreme conditions there. Um, 
Yeah. And then there's three days without water and approximately three weeks without food. Um, when we um, look into some answers that we got before when he raised that question, food was mentioned very high. Uh, in the end, it is not the super first priority also to have at home. What you're seeing now is kind of a preparation pyramid. In general, we would really recommend to have everything at home, and I'm pretty sure the experts will also add to this. Yeah, uh, But if you come to stock up, um, I don't know if you don't have the budget or don't have the time, you need to stock up now. Uh, the suggestion and the priorities are in a form of pyramid. Yeah? First thing that has already been mentioned was, of course, water because three days without water are critical. Um, there's two liters plus one suggested per person per day. Um, two liters means two for drinking and one for um, daily hygiene and also water purification. Then including relevant medication, painkillers uh, and whatever you need. Um, additionally to a well-prepared and cleaned up first aid kit for at home. Um, a blanket, a multi-tool including a knife or a knife including a multi-tool and uh, also very important what you've heard before was an emergency radio which is mainly or most of the time a crank radio um, with light, USB connection if possible and a solar panel because uh, it's, really it's really important to uh, be able to communicate and get some information in cases of emergency. And when you're thinking of uh, stocking up a bag, uh, a flight bag, um, or not only a flight bag, a, a bag you can carry away, these are the must-haves in this bag as well, maybe in a different form. Yeah? Um, uh, maybe you can then also add on what is appropriate first aid in, a, um, in this bag. Yeah? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and only second, but also equally important, of course, is food. If you ask me personally, food would go very high, but not everybody <laughs> sees it the same way. Yeah. Uh, maybe also a small gas cooker, which can also help you to purify water as well, and products for daily hygiene, including waste bags. Uh, then on another, uh, on the third level, you, what has been mentioned before, also at home you should have your hard copies and your, your USB and all USB on a USB stick, and also a little bit of cash. Yeah, ideally you do it, you pack it in the bag and you have it at home. Uh, some additional candy, candles, also a fire extinguisher. I'm talking about a second fire extinguisher here, yeah, not your primary one for your house. And anything for radiation um, protection and gas masks, but uh, the experts will certainly add here. And um, if you have enough space, you could also go for a camping toilet and some additional treats like coffee, uh, coffee and sweets or card games. And especially the card games or the games were a tip from Sasha when he said this was helping his family a lot mentally um, to, to uh, stay kind of in a positive, more positive mood um, in times of flood. This is, I think, really, really valuable tips. Uh, again, we got the question in from many people who were asking uh, what goes into the first aid kit, but as we mentioned, we'll talk about that in much more detail. Uh, so, um, yeah, I guess we'll, a little later we'll talk also what kind of food we would uh, take. Is that something that would, uh, you're going to discuss later? Or maybe you want to just maybe say something about that as well? Um, yeah, um, so basically you go for, um, so it for 10 days per adult, you uh, go for approximately 3.5 kilos for cereals, pasta and similar. Uh, then uh, 2.5 kilos with canned vegetables and beans, um, also fruits and nuts approximately 2.5 kilos, uh, and dairy products, um, fish, meat, and eggs go on a lower level, but it would be 1.5 kilograms, and fats and oils as well. Um, yet what I would recommend here is really to look on regional websites. Um, they, they will provide a full list with what you need to stock up, because this also differs a little bit from region to region. Okay. I guess this is also very important. Um, I guess... Um, I don't know, do any of you have all this at home? Can I ask you? <laughs> actually, um, well, it's strictly, actually, I have most of it at home. Um, I have approximately 27, oh, exactly 27 liters of canned water, and I have um, food candles, um, a, camping, a camping cooker. Not for me, but my, when I started to have a family, because in a in time of crisis, even a blackout, 
the uh, probability is very high that I'm either in the hospital or in the ambulance or the military, so I won't be home. And it's for ease of my mind that my family has a basic kit. My friends normally were laughing about this, but um, well, that's what I have. I guess so there's uh, individual situations uh, that uh, might be different. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, are there any more questions coming in? Um, not to this topic at this point. Yeah. Um, okay. Then I think okay. we'll, we'll just move on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, our next speaker in this field is Tal. You have already heard some comments from him before. Uh, basically, he is a physician uh, specialized in family medicine and pediatrics. Uh, born in Hungary and now working in Israel. Also working in Hungary. Yeah. Um, and he is a uh, representing both uh, medical fields um, as well as uh, the Krav Maga section. Uh, he served in the 202 Paratroopers b uh, Brigade of Israeli Defense. Uh, Defense Force. He also trains the IDF this IDF brigade in terms of uh, self-defense. And in Krav Maga, he's an expert level four, which is also a very, very high black uh, belt uh, referred to other systems. And on top of this, he also has a black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. <laughs> Many thanks, Tal. <laughs> I think you're still muted. Okay. So, a uh, small correction, I was born in Belarusia, in the age of 15 I moved to Israel, and I was studying in Hungary, and I sorry, still partying I'm there. I'm very sorry, the Hungarians, no, cla no, the har no, Hungarians, no. Cla the Hungarians claim you. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, you know, it's, uh, this is the place where I'm uh, basically working. So, um, uh, first I would like to say, um, uh, it's, a, it's a more about the doctor stuff. So the doctors, they have their own issue uh, during the wars and uh, uh, need to deal with uh, uh, multiple dilemmas during the conflict. Uh, first of all, as, uh, as a basic uh, information, different countries have totally different approach uh, to the doctor's preparation. I already mentioned the Israeli system when the res re reserve so uh, soldiers are basically being uh, uh, trained continuously. Uh, most of the countries don't have this luxury or maybe uh, better to say uh, don't need this on the daily basis to trade the medical staff for the for the constant conflicts so they adapted uh, the system of for example every uh, medical student who's finishing the medical education automatically becoming lieutenant and uh, getting officer's degree and once a few years they're undergoing some kind of education on the basis of the university but this is not the field education but more like a theoretical issues more or less like we can do right now here that we will get some information about the traumatology, maybe about uh, conflict resolutions and stuff like that. So it's mainly the theoretical issue. Um, uh, another subject that it's also very important to understand that the doctor's uh, uh, job and the role in the conflict is really much depends either you the occupying force or defending force. Because if you're occupying force or offensive force, let's put it this way, and the war is not taking place on your ground, then the situation is basically not that much affecting of the civilian life because the uh, medical corps is taking care of the wounded um, uh, on the foreign territory. And uh, eventually, uh, if needed, the uh, injured can be transferred back to the safe place to the country. We're very familiar with the system uh, when the American used it in Afghanistan and Iraq, when the wounded were transferred from the hot zone uh, to the Germany, for example, for the therapy, for the treatment. Uh, I cannot say the same about the local uh, inhabitants of uh, uh, these countries, that maybe they receive some primary care, but they definitely left uh, without therapy. Tal, can uh, I just briefly, shortly interrupt you? Maybe you can show your presentation, because uh, we're not seeing it. I'm trying. I'm uh, not really familiar with the system. I'm more familiar uh, <laughs> uh, with the Zoom. So okay. basically, it's on my... Uh, uh, I think you need to just share your presentation. Yeah. The question, how and where I do this. Yeah, how should you? Uh, there's a there's a button that it says uh, share presentations, basically. Uh, sorry for the technical problems. No problem. Uh, I'm trying to share my entire screen, but an, uh, you still can see only me. Uh, yeah, uh, your computer might slow down while running 
Do you see something on my screen? Uh, we see you wonderfully. Uh, which is uh, not a bad news as well. But uh, <laughs> um, so I try to speak uh, okay. because uh, uh, I don't want to uh, spend time on this. And anyway, I will go more with the text. Okay. Uh, you can uh, get the presentation maybe later. They, it can be distributed unless we solve this problem somehow in the next few minutes. Uh, so uh, uh, I will uh, go back to these uh, medical issues which related more to the offensive or defensive force. So the, in the offensive force, uh, uh, civilian doctors, and I guess most of us are uh, those people, uh, they're not really playing a major role uh, in the conflict. Yes, some of them will be recruited by the military, uh, depends on the laws in the country. Uh, but the defensive issue is a little bit uh, harder because uh, the doctors are expected to work uh, many times the job they are not usually performing on the daily life. And as the conflict become longer and longer, this job may uh, get even more sophisticated. Um, so it's not very surprising that gynecologists may suddenly become uh, genial surgeons, for example, due to the lack of uh, genial surgeons uh, or cardiologists who are actually supposed to have a specialization in the cardio on, on the genial, med uh, genial surgery uh, will be asked to perform uh, uh, limb amputations, for example. So um, uh, this is one of the issues now. Uh, the general idea is basically when we're talking about the safety, uh, probably everybody will expect me to speak about physical safety as a major factor, but uh, the point is that I don't think that this is the major point during the conflict. I think that it's basically mental, emotional, and physical safety that must be considered in this situation. And uh, doctors may deal with uh, different uh, problems during the wartime. So the simplest of them is, of course, what I already mentioned. It's dealing with a problem they are not familiar with before. Uh, that, uh, for example, the uh, family physician on the internal medicine physician may find themselves actually as a primary respond responders. So they actually need to work uh, not in the hospital, but on the uh, hot areas, evacuating the people and uh, recognizing what exactly the point of the so-called triage. I guess most of us uh, know what does it mean, the triage. Uh, that it's basically distributing the wounded according to the severity. And uh, it can be distributed to the red, yellow, green, or black. Uh, we can more or less understand that the black is uh, dead and uh, not that much uh, can be done to help them in general. But the red, it's actually the people that in the imminent danger. Yellow, it's uh, intermediate uh, uh, degree injuries. And the green, it's basically the... Uh, the uh, people that uh, have minor wounds and basically can be in some cases even used as assistive personnel on the scene. Uh, there's a very general uh, principle that they teaching in the military. Uh, it's not absolute. But if, they, if, if when you're arriving uh, to the scene, the injured is still yelling, he's not the red, he's yellow. The first attention to those who are quiet which means that probably these people are severely injured and they cannot make voices anymore. So they must get the first uh, attention. Also the red, uh, yellow, uh, uh, green and the black, it's also related to the uh, urgency of transportation. So not only on the severity of the injuries, but also on the urgency of transportation. Uh, many of us not even familiar with this. Uh, uh, some of us familiar uh, in this from work in the hospital, in the ERs or in the clinics, but the triage is totally different because the problems are not the same. So you, definitely working in the ER, it means more like uh, heart diseases, first priority than somebody just has some pneumonia. It's a yellow basically, but it's not the same in the, in the time of war. Uh, the injuries are more severe. The casualties are multi-casualties. In many cases, you find yourself with assisting personnel, which is not precisely trained for these events. And in many cases, you even need to take uh, decisions which are usually you're not asked to do. Uh, as I mentioned before, the Western medicine I'll, is defining- sorry to, inter sorry to interrupt you shortly. We have the presentation here, so I'm trying to show it. Uh, can you just oh. tell me on which slide you are on now? Uh, I'm still on the first one. <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, this one, yeah. 
So um, if to go according to the slides, uh, basically what I mentioned before, it's a lack of uh, assisting personnel or trained personnel, which can help you. In many cases, you need to use civilians in order to uh, provide you assistance. Uh, not everybody in every country familiar even with uh, doing uh, basic life support, not mentioning advanced life support. Definitely even less people familiar what to do in the case of trauma. So you're becoming a leader. From one point of view, this uh, creating uh, the emotional stress on you, and this is the emotional safety that I was talking about. On the other hand, it also can put you in certain level of danger because surrounding area, of course, if the people, if there are relatives to the injured, they will expect you to go as fast as possible to the loved ones and not to the people that from their point of view consider to be neglect neglectable. And therefore, this can create a conflict in which you will need to deal with. And like Sasha said, training, training, training. Uh, doing martial arts is not only good for self-defense, but also for the confidence and leadership. Uh, I will not mention specifically the names. You can choose yourself. OK? Uh, another issue is basically uh, lack of equipment and, and medical supplies. As we even see today, these days in Ukraine, the uh, pharmacies are being looted very fast. The medical supply is disappearing very fast. And people who are the civilians are actually suffering the most because they are the first that losing appro uh, uh, approach to the medical services. You are the one carrying the bag with the medication and equipment. You may become a target just because of that reason that you are the carrying the necessary equipment or necessary medications. So this would also you need to be prepared that you're not al always the savior, but you're also the target, okay? Uh, what I mentioned before, it's a high number of casualties, which usually we're not uh, really uh, dealing with. I mean, uh, in most parts of the world, uh, ma massive casualties is a car accident with three injured or five injured. Uh, definitely everybody remember what happens on 9-11 when the medical staff was totally unprepared and, uh, you know, the American emergency system is quite developed, a German even better if I, uh, if I know, and still there was total mess up and uh, uh, disorientation and uh, I will a little bit uh, try to answer the question about the freezing that everybody asked. It's impossible to avoid freezing the question if you trained enough to shorten this dura duration. So some people get into the trauma and they cannot escape it for minutes, hours, and they just like a, a her, her, herd, they're running away from the danger. There are people that freezing, waking up after a few seconds and taking action. And you as a doctors, you are the ones that's supposed to run in the opposite direction from the crowd. So if the crowd is escaping, you should go into the danger. They usually say it about the policeman and the firefighters, but you are part of this emergency team. So this is what is expected from you. Uh, another important issue is uh, also to understand that during the war, the uh, essential medical services are being uh, lacking and not only uh, in, in medical services, but also th such things as uh, lights, water, uh, communication. So everything becomes more uh, problematic from point of view of uh, dealing with the problems. You can imagine what happens if during the surgery, there is some, uh, suddenly there is a, a light switching off and you need to switch to the reserve. Hopefully that you have one and it's not destroyed. Uh, during the World War II, they were uh, basically uh, doing uh, surgeries in the field and under the uh, simple lights, lighter slides. So, Again, I'm already taking it to maybe very deep. It must be a really prolonged conflict in order for these things to happen. Uh, another thing that you may deal with, it's basically the lack of hygiene and lack of sleep. Uh, during the war, you really don't, you know what, not even during the war. In, in Israeli conflict, a lot of doctors doing performing double shift and triple shifts. And uh, I guess that during the conflict, it's expected from everybody. Uh, okay. And another emotional slash mental uh, state, it's basically the expectations, expectations of your own from yourself, but also answering the expectations of the others around. So you're not uh, bulletproof from the external and internal criticism. 
And there's a very uh, good sentence uh, which used uh, frequently on the motivation speech, which more or less say that it doesn't matter what happened yesterday. It doesn't matter about the thing that you feel guilty about. If you wouldn't do it today, you're convicting an innocent people. So all your mistake that you did yesterday, they over. You need to pull yourself together and do your job the way it's supposed to. Slide number two. Okay. Uh, tools that may benefit you uh, during the conflict. Of course, it's a, uh, do, you, do you know what are these three symbols? So uh, these symbols, it's an international uh, symbol that's supposed to uh, show you belonging to the medical staff. Uh, so it's uh, the cross, the half a moon, and the uh, diamond. They call it diamond for some, uh, some way, which is basically showing you neutral position. So having those is important. When we're talking about the medical symbols, they may include few things. First of all, it's a wristband that you're usually supposed to put, the medical apron that you're uh, putting on your body with representing your belonging to the medical staff. Uh, it's not a bad idea in the uh, part of conflict, especially if your primary sponsor is to have a helmet and to have a vest. Um, also uh, quite important to have a comfortable boots and uh, not to travel in convoy, a convoy with the military because you're becoming basically an illegitimate, uh, legitimate target this way. Uh, medical kit, I already heard that uh, people uh, that previous, uh, previously were talking about this. So the medical kit uh, may include many things. It pretty much depends on the doctor's uh, ability to perform things, I think. So nobody will carry uh, in the bag the things that I don't know what to do with them. Uh, but there are standard medical kits, uh, kits that are uh, provided, for example, by the military, uh, this way or another. Of course, it's important to have a, a personal assisting uh, personnel, even if it's just the people who are traveling with you, the people who can assist. You cannot uh, uh, do everything alone. Um, uh, what I mentioned before, it's uh, triage knowledge and authority. So when you're coming to the scene, you expect it to be the leading uh, person on the scene. Unless there is a military personnel, then you're simply becoming the, I don't want to say a slave, but uh, kind of following the orders. Uh, uh, previous experience is necessary. There is no way in the world without previous experience, you will come to the point of the conflict and feel comfortable with that. It's true that uh, what I say before, that uh, it's not important how much you can prepare yourself. Eventually in the war, things going differently, but as closer you can get in, uh, to the situation, it will prepare you at least in some degree to the incoming problems. Uh, in the martial arts uh, specifically, or the uh, games, group games, uh, almost not important which, in, including basketball. You're studying these things as a communication with the staff uh, co uh, cooperating in a group. So again, my suggestion, it's not only good for the physical activity, which you will require in the time of war, but also in order to study the communication and uh, uh, to be able to communicate uh, with people from the different level of knowledge. Uh, ability to improvise, yeah, this is always uh, nice uh, because, you know, you need to uh, take care of the uh, fracture, so not always the equipment is there, but if you uh, know how to use a few wooden plates uh, in order to fix the fractured uh, body part, it's already as a, a good uh, start, at least. And in the end, I wrote self-defense skills. Uh, guys, you may be a target. There is no question that each one of us can become a target uh, due to the uh, what I will mention basically uh, the next. Okay, so uh, yeah, uh, what will make you or may make you a target? So I specifically wrote down that there were 930 doctors killed during the Syrian conflict. As we all remember, Syria is not such a huge country. Uh, the proportion of the doctors in the country is uh, relatively small. So even in this situation, uh, 930 doctors were killed until today. So it's a huge number, basically. When we're considering that the doctors consider to be neutral and uh, not supposed to be directly participating in the fight, it's a very, it's a lot. 
Okay? So uh, the same medical symbols or uh, markings which may uh, provide uh, you with the benefits of being on the scene can also make you a target, as I mentioned before, due to the equipment and the medications that you carry. The same can be uh, told about your transportation, uh, which I put all the uh, equipment stuff. So I guess uh, you heard, and if you're not, uh, there are in multiple conflicts in which the uh, ambulances were hijacked by the groups and used for the transportation of the weapons, ammunition, and even stuff. Because it's considered to be that the medical staff, it's a peaceful, neutral, and then they can be used for the purposes of the war. Uh, lack of assisting person, uh, uh, person, personnel can also make you a target because when people see you alone, you're becoming a target during the war. Uh, it's seen uh, when you're alone, you're being considered as hopeless, helpless, and you can be used. Uh, during the war, it's not uh, conflict time. In many cases, it's not important how correct you are not. It's more, uh, uh, it's more what you're showing to the surrounding. You still may be the best solution and the best uh, chance for people to survive. So the authority is necessary. On the other hand, if you're doing too much authority, you may challenge others. So be, uh, you need to find a certain uh, uh, level in which you do use the authority, but you're not over authorizing yourself, not putting yourself on the position of God and saver, but working in communication with others uh, in order to diminish uh, the pressure which may be put on you. Uh, lack of triage knowledge. This is more like uh, becoming a target. Uh, so uh, what I told you that this decision must be, must be taken uh, during the conflict. Uh, your inability to take decisions may be seen as a weakness and you may become a target. Uh, uh, as you could see probably in Ukrainian conflict, uh, hospitals is not a safe spot anymore. So they can become a target. They can be taken as a hostage, uh, hostages as it's happened now in Mariupol when 400 uh, people slash medical staff is being uh, held as a hostages uh, by the Russian forces. Or at least this is the information we, what we hear. I cannot really confirm this because I'm not there. Um, Kai, uh, sorry, just uh, just uh, quickly. Um, at this point, we received a question that might be suitable here, yeah. um, and, and it has been asked. Um, as you mentioned, the medical symbols might make you a target. Um, does it make sense in this context to hide those symbols? Or when does it make sense to hide these symbols? Uh, if you're traveling alone, and better to hide these symbols if it's possible. But if you're working in the convoy of the, pri of the primary responders, it's better to have them on. So this will be my question. If, you, if you're traveling in the limited group, limited group, which cannot really uh, deal with the external threats, it's better not to have those. It may automatically make you a target. Uh, many thanks, many thanks. Maybe we continue now um, as in order not to run out of time. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'm ready for questions because it's really left only uh, some uh, few slides, but uh, I'm uh, ready to questions if somebody has. Just a, and if not, uh, continue. A question from my side. Um, I, of course, I'm not an expert in this field, but how do you see this? You mentioned it in, 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 a, in a statement that there's a little bit of a blurring between medical personnel and uh, people who help. Of course, uh, medical personnel is obviously the expert, but uh, very frequently we need to maybe train or have other people that kind of join in this, uh, in this endeavor to help others. Uh, the people, uh, the, uh, if I'm not talking about the basically bystanders, so people uh, more or less can perform certain tasks that you uh, give them. The only question is to teach yourself what will be your commands or orders to the others. Uh, to start explaining in the very complicated medical uh, language about what you expect them to do may be very hard. So those people who are bystanders and not medical staff, they usually uh, used for take the wounded, put him here, hold here, take a towel, hold this wound, uh, press here, 
put the bandage there. So it, you, you're not using these people for the precise medical procedures. You're not expecting them, expecting them even to do maybe uh, uh, basic life support. But those are people who can use uh, the minimal knowledge if you give them the correct orders, if it's answering your question. I think this is a definitely important point. Um, maybe I can just uh, uh, show you one slide that I would like you to answer. I mean, of course, it's not necessarily mm -hmm. now only related to um, medical doctors, but to soldiers in general. This is something I came across, which was a little bit shocking. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, that was uh, the issue of uh, the U.S. military um, has more victims of suicide since the 9-11 um, episode than actually people dying during military operations. So this, this comes again to this whole issue of, um, of stress. Is this something that um, you, know, you can relate to or is this something which is a little bit overblown? Yeah, this is what is basically, I mentioned that uh, my point of safety, that this is basically the issue. The physical safety is a minor point of it. It's a mental and emotional safety because whatever happens during the war, it follows you uh, in the future. The every failure that you have or you feel failure or you consider this to be a failure, it may affect your life. So uh, people who've been in the conflict, uh, first of all, it's different in many uh, cases to assimilate uh, to the uh, civilian life. Uh, one of the things that uh, we actually can see this uh, not only in the Israeli mili uh, American military, but also in the Israeli military, the soldiers who participated in the operation and consider themselves as a very useful and important during the wars when they come into the civilian life, they're losing this importance in the eyes of the society and this affecting them on the way that they cannot adjust. So basically, the adjustment disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder is totally underdiagnosed, especially due to the reason that all these military people, uh, I guess that if you, can, if you will go deeper into the statistics, you will see that a relatively high percent of those who are committing suicide, it's actually fighting stuff. Maybe not the, uh, actually the stuff on the front lines, because uh, they, they are the one that under the tremendous stress, but they are totally being unappreciated uh, in the time of uh, when they're coming back. And another thing that it's simple thing that they saw so many things that they having continuous flashbacks. On the other hand, these people consider to be, uh, themselves to be uh, emotionally sick, emotionally uh, strong, physically strong. So they very rarely going to, the, to hell. So I don't know what this, this statistics shows, for example, but it will be interesting to know how many of these people actually turn to help. Yeah, this is definitely an interesting topic that has always gone through the news. Um, and uh, what one thing that I learned here is that it seems to be also related to the type of injuries that are seen in the field, that it's these IEDs, these mines, these blast injuries that seem to also cause more traumatic brain injury. Uh, yeah. Is that something that you can see as well? Or is that something that you can relate to? Uh, yeah, so this traumatic head injury is basically the new diagnosis, which is actually more like a clinical picture and not uh, the real uh, uh, real physical diagnosis that you can make. So all these head injury, which today they call it traumatic head injuries as a diagnosis, they don't show any marking on the MRI or CT if you're performing them uh, as a follow-up. But it's more like... Uh, uh, let's say brain localizing PTSD, but it's not really answering the PTSD uh, standards because in order to be diagnosed with uh, PTSD, you need to have uh, uh, flashbacks, uh, night sleeping disorder, uh, anxiety issues and stuff. So it's not fully answering to the same diagnosis, but they definitely have shorter flashbacks, unexpected flashbacks. So... Um, um, Okay, so uh, just for the explanation for the viewers, PTSD uh, is post-traumatic stress syndrome. Is that right? Disorder, yeah. yeah Disorder, yeah. yes. So, and it's something that uh, you would get if you are uh, confronted with traumatic and you know threatful situations. Uh, could you maybe just say a little bit about uh, what it really is and and how it affects? Um, 
So uh, PTSD, it's actually the diagnosis which cannot, see, uh, cannot be seen in the initial injury or initial uh, uh, event. So most of the people, for example, if you're considering this, uh, talking about the wartime, the soldiers, they do not experience it during the operation, but all the symptoms are actually appearing at a time later. So after uh, basically the stress is going, uh, disappearing, when actually the person starts to uh, run in a loop and the feedback, what happened during the time. And this feedback basically creating uh, events of the anxiety, insomnia, lack of sleeping, uh, flashbacks, uh, palpitations, difficulty breathing, uh, inability to, uh, to integrate yourself in the social life, uh, even paranoia, if you can say that. So uh, in order to create this diagnosis, this symptom is supposed to be present at least three, three months. And uh, again, in many cases, it's being uh, uh, treated not correctly uh, due to the misunderstanding of the problem. So according to the Israeli data, at least, and we have some due to the uh, uh, effects, uh, due to the conflict that he, uh, we had, the average time of diagnosis is about three years. Even that everybody knows that it's existing, it still takes time because at the beginning, uh, it, it's not a diagnosis after one uh, conversation with the psychiatrist or psychologist. Yeah. It's basically, uh, you need to pull this information uh, from the people because not always they are aware uh, that they actually have it or they try partly to hide it. Mm -hmm. So they're getting many different uh, therapies and many differ, uh, dif uh, different diagnoses before, mm -hmm. such as uh, depression, anxiety, panic attacks, simple insomnia, uh, some even receiving some kind of schizoaffective disorder, which can actually also uh, appear after the traumatic mm -hmm. events. Okay, uh, just to add to this, um, this is not only related to soldiers, but also to the civilians there, of course. And yes, of uh, some course. of the research that I did showed that there are some risk factors that women are more affected than men. Mm -hmm. It's uh, obviously mothers, um, and it seems to, of course, also affect children. And those children uh, that have more confident mothers who support them probably have less um, of these effects. So I think this is a very important role for the mothers. And, of course, it's the way that the society reacts afterwards and the social acceptance which plays a role. But on the positive side, despite all these uh, traumatic, um, you know, of course, stress syndromes, there is a still a large part for some reason or other who, despite the fact that they're in very, very critical situations, do not get uh, any post-traumatic stress uh, disease. So uh, it seems to be that some populations are also resilient in some way or other. Is that something that you can relate to or maybe you want to add something to this? Uh no, not that much to it, but definitely post-trauma, it's not related only to the military conflicts. It can be uh, post-rape, it uh, can be a battery in the families, uh, the children who are being abused at homes. Uh, so uh, after even criminal activities, you know, I personally have one patient who was shot, not in the war. And he's with the diagnosis of PTSD constantly. And uh, the problem is that uh, uh, with PTSD that uh, it's basically uh, the lack of the obvious therapy. So uh, yes, they're taking uh, some antidepressants sometimes. Uh, in many cases, they need CBT, which is cognitive behavior ter therapy, or DBT, which is the... Uh, no, when they're talking about the problem as a theater. So they're presenting themselves in the form of other. Uh, I don't know uh, how it's in your countries, but it definitely today cannabis entered the uh, field of the PTSD. And even there is a research with MDMA goes on the low doses, MDMA going for the therapy of the PTSD. Everybody knows what is MDMA, right? Good. Uh... <laughs> Many thanks for your contribution. Uh, just to mention, there are also some uh, questions from the audience. At this point, we will cover uh, in time also with your inputs. Um, yeah, and now we are handing over basically. Yeah. Okay, so I'd like to come to a new topic now, or another topic which is also on the top of our list of uh, threats that we are maybe now confronted more with more than ever, and that is the issue of radiation. I want to now introduce uh, Gerald Porenta, who is a dear friend of mine, who I've worked together for many, many years. He's a cardiologist. He's a nuclear medicine specialist. 
He's someone who's uh, been very strongly, of course, associated with IT. He has a, he's a CEO of a company dealing with telemedicine. Uh, and he um, has a lot of experience, of course, in the area of uh, nuclear medicine and also uh, radiation exposure. So, Gerold, um, I'm, I'm really, really looking forward to hear what can we do to uh, prevent radiation from harming us? Well, Tommy, thank you very much. First is the question always, can you see and hear me? Very clearly. And you see my slides. Not yet. Uh -huh. Now we see them. Wait, no, no we no. don't see them. Now you see them, now you don't. Let's see here. Yes. Here we go? Yes. All right. Well, Tommy, thank you for inviting me to give this lecture. It was a bit unexpected. But my task today will be to talk about this accidental radiation exposure and medical implications and learning from the past. So I would like to start to give you a little bit of background again so to understand what radiation really is. Um, probably not all of you are aware of all the stuff that I'm showing you. Um, radiation, uh, the concept has been described about 100 years ago when they looked into some elements and they found that they emit some sort of stuff. And then they looked what sort of stuff was coming out of these elements and they saw it could either be a particle or it could be just energy coming out of the nucleus of an atom. And then uh, they said, well, let's talk about these different types of radiation. And for lack of knowing what they did, they said alpha, beta, gamma. Now, the alpha radiation is uh, a particulate radiation. You see it on the top right. Where out of the nucleus is emitted a helium nucleus, uh, and that travels along and then does some damage when it gets deposited. The beta radiation is a particulate radiation. Uh, what could happen in a unstable nucleus is that a neutron uh, decomposes into a proton and an electron. And the electron gets kicked out of the nucleus and then also travels for some uh, distance until it affects the surrounding tissue. And the gamma radiation is just pure energy coming out of the nucleus. That's the same thing as uh, X-ray or also uh, light. But if it's a, the high energy, we call it gamma radiation. Um, all of these radiations that you see here um, are ionizing. That means if the radiation occurs, it goes into the tissue uh, where it has the effect and creates ions. Of course, there's also non-ionizing radiation, and that radiation would be radio frequencies or light or UV uh, light. So that does not cause ionization. So ionization basically is just telling you there is damage. So that's not good if you get this into the body. One concept which is very important for radioactivity is the concept of half-life. If you look at a substance, uh, if uh, this uh, nucleus emits some radiation, it does it only once and changes to a different uh, nucleus then. Um, so it only has a chance to do this uh, event once. And if you look at all the molecules that are sitting there, in one time period which called is half-life, half of them um, disintegrate. And the next half-life, again, half of it disintegrates. So what you get is an exponential decay. And if you look at 10 times the half-life, which is one half over the power of 10, it's about declining to one thousandth of the initial activity. And so we usually say, if we are out in 10 times the half-life, then we don't see any of this radioactivity anymore. Now, elements are very different. Um, Half-life could be as short as just 0.3 microseconds, which would be polonium-212, which you don't really uh, probably get into contact with much, and could be very, very long. And the longest one is Tellur-128, which has a half-life, which is more than the existence of the universe. Um, now, when we look at these uh, isotopes, you get these uh, schemes that may look a little bit complicated, but let me uh, show you some of the information on there that may be important. Now, here we look at the uh, cesium-137, 
And on the top left, you see it has a half-life of 30 years. Now, I put up cesium here because this is one of the more important isotopes that gets produced in a nuclear accident, either as a uh, nuclear power plant problem or either also in an atomic bomb. So that's one of the isotopes we deal with, and we'll talk about this later a little bit more. And when we look at these decay schemes, it will also tell us how the decay happens. And in this case, uh, cesium-137 can decay by ex uh, expelling an electron with an energy of 0.512 mega electron volts into barium. Uh, 137M, which is metastable, and that will decay then to the final stable stuff. So all of these radiations can occur, or can also occur that the cesium or goes directly to the stable element. Uh, of course, when a uh, incident occurs and these isotopes get generated, isotopes can also uh, be decomposing into other isotopes. There could be also some more isotopes in one of these schemes. Now, let's look into what are the isotopes that are interesting in a nuclear accident. Now, if an, uh, a nuclear power plant uh, has an accident, and say this is Chernobyl, there's about 100 isotopes that are produced after a nuclear accident. But only a very small fraction of these isotopes are really relevant. Most of the isotopes uh, are staying at the area where the accident occurs and may not be relevant for uh, people who live hundreds of kilometers uh, away from this accident. But there's three isotopes that uh, concern us most. Uh, and the foremost isotope and the most important one is the iodine-131. We'll talk about this later a little bit more. Um, this is an isotope which has a very short half-life, and that's the good part about it. It's a half-life of eight days. So remember, after 10 half-lives, it would be 80 days, probably all of the activity is gone. Uh, that also tells you whatever iodine-131 was generated at the Chernobyl accident, it's gone by now. It's not an issue anymore now. Radiation is uh, by uh, electron emission. We have a lot of experience with iodine-131 because that's also an isotope we use for therapy. So if people do have thyroid problems, some of them we can treat with uh, iodine therapy. And in that case, we give iodine-131 to these people. They can swallow it. And then the effect is um, when the iodine is taken up by the thyroid. Uh, the second and third isotope that are important after nuclear accident is strontium-90 which is uh, a half-life of 28 years, almost 30 years. It also is uh, beta emission. And then there's cesium-137, and that's probably the most common isotope we have left from the Chernobyl accident, and that will be uh, around for some years to come. But I will tell you a little bit later that right now this is not a big problem, <clears throat> but it is something that uh, stays around for 30 years half-life, so um, a long, long time. Now, how can you shield from these radiations? Uh, alpha radiation, it's very easy to shield yourself from it. It's just a sheet of paper. It cannot pass through it. Uh, that's the good part. The bad part is if you have an alpha emitting agent and it's in your tissue, uh, that carries a lot of energy and can make a lot of damage. So alpha radiation has a lot of damage. Uh, we use some of alpha radiation active isotopes in uh, therapy, but not very many. Now, the beta radiation, and you've seen just before, this would be the iodine-131 or the cesium. Uh, you can shield with a sheet of aluminum, and uh, that will take care of it. Uh, and then there's the gamma radiation, and that's the radiation which is pure energy. It's not particulate, but that can go through... Um, all kinds of substances, also concrete and lead, and it only depends on how much energy the gamma ray has, and it's much more difficult to protect from. Now, what sort of tissue damage can occur by radiation? Well, how does radiation really affect the tissue? Well, radiation uh, carries with it energy, and if the radiation goes into the body, it deposits the energy there, and that's usually not good. Uh, if you want to take a comparison, it's like 
putting a lot of uh, heat into a tiny spot. So it's like burning injury. And some of the radiation damage is actually very similar to burns. Um, the action of the radioactive isotope could be in two ways. One is deterministic. This is when you have a lot of energy being released, then we know that you will get a problem very soon. And deterministic actions occur within days to weeks, and um, uh, you will always see them. And uh, it's like an acute radiation syndrome, so that's something that occurs uh, after high, um, uh, high release and has a latency time of up to 30, 90 days. Now, the, the real other effect that we're concerned with, it's a stochastic effect, and this is a probabilistic effect. Effect. And this is where cancer comes in. Um, for the lower uh, energies that get admitted, these effects can come much later. And it can even be later, like up to 30 years. And you don't know who gets it. So uh, you may have the same radiation exposure to two people. One may get cancer, the other not. If you have deterministic action, if you have the same amount of energy deposited in the body, both of them get the same, sin, uh, the same um, symptoms. Now, just to give you a little bit of an idea, alpha radiation has an energy of 5 mega electron volts, which is for one radiation not so much. But in terms of how does it compare to the energy in one molecule, it's a lot. It's 10 to the 6 power more than the binding energy in molecules. So you can imagine if there's one alpha ray coming into a molecule, deposits all its energy there, it just blows up the molecule that's there. Now, we're interested in the biologic effects of radiation. And uh, there is one way of uh, measuring this, and we have some units for that. And let me explain how that works. You have the energy that's deposited by the radioactive isotope, and that we measure in gray, and that's one joule per kilogram of absorbed dose. So that's just the energy that gets put there. However, it is different if the energy is put there by a gamma radiation or by a alpha ray, because the spatial and temporal resolution of the deposited energy, they differ so much. So we cannot say um, this person get one gray and this person get one gray of radiation and assume that they have the, the same, um, that same damage. This is why there is this quality factor, uh, which sort of um, uh, gets into the equation how damaging the um, radiation is. Now, for most of the radiation we're talking uh, today, that's beta and gamma radiation, the quality factor is just one. And in order to see this new um, unit, uh, you convert one gray by the quality factor and you get a sievert. So sievert is the unit of um, energy that includes the biologic effect. And we're always talking about the sieverts. Now, one sievert is a very, very um, high dose. And most of the doses uh, we are talking today are much smaller. So usually, and in the following talk, I will be referring to this as millisievert. And I will show you how much radiation dose um, this is. Um, also, just to show you how big this quality factor can be, there is some uh, neutron radiation uh, which can go up to 20. Now, sievert is the equivalent dose. That means this is what the biologic effect is. And this also reflects the stochastic health uh, risk. For those of you who may have been around a little bit longer, about my age, you may remember that there was once a uh, unit called REM. Um, and that's uh, basically the same concept as the seabird now. Now, how much radiation do we get in our daily lives? There is all kinds of radiation around us. And the average exposure in uh, Western Europe is in the area of two to four millisieverts per year. That's the energy that is around us and that we are being constantly exposed to. Now, if you're a flight personnel, if you do a lot of flights, um, transatlantic flights, um, you will get a uh, higher um, radiation exposure because in the higher heights, there is more um, radiation. Can go up to 20 millisieverts per year and 
cosmonauts, they are a very, very dangerous situation. <clears throat> they 400 millisieverts per year. Um, also, uh, there are some um, rules in different countries. For example, I think in Germany, if you have 100 millisieverts for seven days, you should evacuate that part of the country that has this uh, uh, activity. Now, the deterministic effects, these are the biologic effects. If you have uh, a radiation exposure of 10,000 millisieverts, which is 10 sieverts, then people die within 30 days. We don't have a lot of uh, uh, this happening, and you will see later uh, that we don't have, with the exception of the atomic bomb, anything in this, in this range from the um, atomic power problems, power plant problems. Now, with 2.5 sieverts or 2,500 millisieverts, you have an acute radiation syndrome, which is loosely looking like burning injuries. Um, if you get a radiation of 500 millisieverts, you have reversible changes in the complete blood count. So that's something you can see. Now, if you come down to 250 millisieverts, um, you can see some effects in the chromosomes, but you will not see something when you look at people who got this radiation. <clears throat> and below 100 millisieverts, there is uh, no deterministic effects. So all of this following talk will be mostly concerned about the radiation that's down to below 100 millisieverts. Um, now let's talk about the banana. And I'm sorry to say, uh, you probably from today on, you will not see the banana as an innocent fruit anymore. And the reason is potassium-40. I just want to show you what the ambient radiation um, um, is and how much the effect is. Now, one banana has 0 0.5 gram of potassium, and we know that about 0.01% of potassium is potassium-40. Now, this is a radioactive um, element. It emits beta and gamma radiation on a very low level, though. So you have about 20 becquerel, which is decays per second, of beta and gamma radiation with an atom of potassium-40. And uh, that means if you feed your kids uh, bananas, you feed your kids radioactivity. Actually, um, out of the um, radioactivity that have, we have in our food, uh, potassium-40 accounts for about 50%. So that's about uh, uh, half of what you get through the food is from potassium-40. Also, if you think, well, that doesn't sound like a lot, um, I can tell you that in your body right now, all of us have about um, 700 million radioactive events every day. So all of us are already affected by radioactivity, but that doesn't really hurt us. But you have 700 million uh, decay events in your body every day. Now let's talk a little bit more about radiation damage. Um, if you have an external radiation source, um, you get burn injury. This is the deterministic effect, and that's not contagious. So if you find somebody who got radiation from, let's say, a radiation therapy device malfunctioning, uh, and you get uh, called to, to help them, uh, there is nothing you have to worry about yourself because once the energy has been deposited in the body of the patient, there is nothing that really affects you as a helper. So that's not an issue. The issue with radiation damage that's more important for the helpers is incorporation and contamination. Now that is if you take a radioactive um, substance like iodine-131 and you inhale it or it gets splashed on your skin. If you come there as a helper, this uh, radioactive isotope can, of course, leave the body of the person that has uh, incorporated it, and then it will also affect you. So if you come to a, um, an accident with uh, radioactive substances, which is not just external radiation, but where there is contamination or incorporation, you have to act as if this was a bacterial infection because it could affect you. What's the death toll the, related to radioactive events? Well, um, the worst one, of course, was the atomic bombs in Japan. 
in Hiroshima on the 6th of August 1945. Um, this one bomb was dropped. It killed 70,000 people uh, just at that uh, bomb dropping, and it caused 70,000 further deaths later on. So this was uh, a devastating event. And the next day we had uh, Nagasaki, which had a bomb half the size of Hiroshima, so another 35,000 people were killed. So this is uh, uh, the only, so far, the only place where atomic bombs have really killed people. Now, the next event that occurred where there was a lot of radioactivity exposed was Chernobyl in 1986, and I'll talk about a little bit uh, about this later. We had at that place 237 directly exposed people, and there was 28 deaths, and 134 developed an acute radiation syndrome. So this is the deterministic effects, uh, and we'll see later what the um, stochastic effects and the cancer rates are. In Fukushima, which occurred in 2011, there was also an, um, a nuclear power plant problem. It was about 10 to 20 percent of the activity release that we saw in Chernobyl. There were no radiation deaths, but there was 160 workers exposed to um, a dose um, more than 100 millisieverts, where we think the deterministic effects um, occur. What was also very interesting, there's lots of interesting things, stories you can learn from these events. One is that uh, you would think that people in uh, working in a power plant, they know that if there is a problem, they ha should take the uh, potassium pills, and uh, also that will come on later. Uh, that didn't happen because the workers just didn't take it. And also, uh, they were not really uh, wearing protective uh, covers. So some of the workers got really bad deterministic um, burn injuries on their feet, for example, because not wearing uh, the correct shoes. Now, Chernobyl, April 26, 1986, a large population, uh, particularly at and a very young me, age. Excuse me, sorry for interrupting now, because uh, you targeted a topic where we actually have received also beforehand a lot of questions already, because um, you already mentioned radiant radiation damage, and one of the questions was uh, whether there's any surgical method to treat, treat radiation damage and how to react accordingly. Well, radiation uh, damage by surgery, there is some ways of treating it, of course, but only for the deterministic part. If you have very large burn injuries, then you have to get in a plastic surgeon to do debris, debrisment and uh, cleaning the wounds and so on. So only for the deterministic effects, there is no um, uh, surgical method that can clear the stochastic effects. So you cannot get out the uh, iodine or the cesium from the body. And these are the two most important uh, um, isotopes here. Um, and uh, most of the problem that was caused in Chernobyl was not direct exposure, but eating contaminated food. That's the main issue. And let me just uh, quickly go to three, four more slides, and then I'm done. Um, if you look at how Chernobyl affected us, on the left side, you have the um, radiation exposure in the year 1986, so this was the first year, and you see the light um, uh, yellow stuff is less than 0.5 millisieverts, so not very much, about 25% of what, what your normal yearly exposure is, so it stayed pretty much in the region uh, of uh, Belarus and uh, uh, Ukraine. And when you look at the uh, right map, you see 20 years of uh, uh, radiation exposure. And if you accumulate it over 30, uh, 20 years, you still see it's mostly a localized issue. So uh, in, the, in the Western countries, we were not affected too much uh, from the fallouts. Yes, there is some thyroid cancers. Um, and you can see it affects mostly uh, the young people who get a lot of radiation. At the top row is the people less than 15 years old, so they are the most likely affected. But if you get more than 25 millisieverts, then also the older people can get thyroid uh, cancers, which is usually a very uncommon uh, cancer. So what are the learnings from Chernobyl cancers other than thyroid cancer? Uh, possibly doubling in the risk of leukemia am among cleanup workers, but not for people in the remote region, and a small increase in the incidence of premenopausal breast cancer. 
and both of which appear to be related to radiation dose. So actually, uh, the risk for the people who are there is, is higher. The risk for remote people is not so high. You can measure uh, radioactivity by counters, which you can buy dosimeters, which measure the dosage and whole body counters. Um, uh, for protection, the best thing, of course, is to avoid exposure. It's not always possible. Avoid incorporation if at all possible, because once the isotope is inside you, it will stay there. You cannot cut it out and you cannot get it out. <clears throat> Use shielding and apply distance. Um, and the decorporation, getting the stuff out again, is sometimes you can do some things to, to, to try to get the isotope out, but usually it does not work. But let's talk about the iodine, and that's last, my last uh, topic of today, is uh, how can you make sure that the iodine does not get taken up by the thyroid? And the best thing of doing that is giving potassium iodide, because that will be taken up in the thyroid. And then when the radioactive thyro uh, iodine comes along, it will not get into the thyroid anymore and pass through the body, and you would not have a problem. Um, how do you do that? Um, there is this potassium iodide tablets. In Austria, uh, there are 65 milligram tablets, and one 65 milligram potassium iodide tablet has 50 milligram of iodide. It prevents the uptake of further iodide into the thyroid gland, but you should take it only after being told to do so by the health authorities. Half-time of the thyroidal iodine is seven weeks. Now remember, the half-time of the radioactive iodine was just uh, eight days, so about one week. So if you take the thyroid iodine early enough, it will stay in and block the thyroid long enough so that there is no more iodine-131 um, uh, there. But the timing is critical. <clears throat> you cannot take it after exposure for a too long time. So if you wait for one, uh, for one uh, day, that would be too long. There are some contraindications for the potassium iodide, which is hypothyroidosis because it would heat it up. Um, if you have nodules, you shouldn't take it. An allergy to iodine, which is not very common, and the other things are also very uncommon. Now, how do you take the potassium iodide, the dosing? And that's important. Um, let's do the last row first. Adults older than 40 years do not take it because uh, in your case, it doesn't make sense as the damage uh, may be bigger than uh, the benefit. But the people who are most affected of the radioactive iodine is the young people. So if you're pregnant or lactating women, they should take two tablets. Children, even less than one month, even the very young ones should take uh, the iodine. And then when they get older, the dosing gets up. Adolescents, two tablets, and adults less than 40 years, also two tablets. And it's only a once treatment. You swallow it, and that's it. Now, take home messages. The risk in the remote areas is very low for radioactive exposure. The main issue is incorporation and not external radiation exposure. And the iodide tablets, which has been a big topic in the last couple of weeks now, it's one oral dose, only for a selected group of exposed individuals. And the risk reduction is really there for younger people and not for the older ones. So I'm ready to take any questions that you may have. Thank you for listening. Well, uh, Gerald, many, many thanks. I think this gives us a lot of information, also information which I think is relatively reassuring, at least for those who are not in the clear vicinity of such a catastrophe as, for example, in Chernobyl. Um, does the weather in any way play a role if you have uh, weather conditions? Because uh, if you look at the, the map of Europe, um, we had different radiations in different parts of the Europe, which is not necessarily related to the distance from Chernobyl. Yeah, the weather plays, of course, a big role because the um, iodine-131 is um, taken away by clouds. Uh, it's not so heavy, so it's distributed by the weather condition. And uh, depending on which way the, uh, the wind blows, it will carry these isotopes also for a long uh, way. So um, actually, this is, um, um, was distributed to the more eastern part of Europe, and we still have some activity there in uh, in uh, in venison and in also some mushrooms so if you um, eat uh, mushrooms and venison for 100 percent of your food intake you probably at the present now you will get about uh, 0. i think they, they said 0. 0.5 millisievert per year so it's still less than the normal radiation you get 
Uh, from Fukushima, <clears throat> there was no radiation that would, would get to us. So uh, that was too far away. But weather is critical, yes. We got a question from the auditorium, from the audience here. Um, iodine tablets, if you have hyperthyroidism. Yeah, well, for hyperthyroidism, don't take it because it will make it uh, much worse. Um, actually, m not many people run around who are hyperthyroid, yeah? Um, um, uh, but uh, if you give somebody who has uh, a hyperthyroidism like autoimmune thyroiditis, Spazitov, it will be in a situation which can be also critical. So you can get very sick by that. Um, uh, so uh, hyperthyroidism is not a um, uh, situation where you want to give extra iodine to the thyroid. And what about amiodarone if their patients are taking amiodarone? Which well, um, most of uh, you know amiodarone is a cardiac medication for uh, rhythm control or, or uh, in atrial fibrillation and has a lot of iodine inside. Now, um, actually, if you're on amiodarone, you don't need the uh, iodine tablets because you've had eating iodine for a long time, so your thyroid probably is blocked uh, by the time. So people are on um, um, amiodarone, they probably wouldn't need it, but uh, it wouldn't hurt them if you swallow it anyway. Okay. Uh, we, we got one more question maybe we'll take, uh, which again was the question of um, 40 years old. Um, is it also valid if contraindications are ruled out? Um, is that, uh, or is it just basically that the statistics shows that the incidence of cancer is so low that it doesn't make sense? Uh, well, the, the, the 40 years is, is, is sort of a, an artificial cut point, of course. Um, uh, if somebody is 41 years and he's very concerned uh, and he thinks he, he, he wants to take it, he can take it. It's, it's not an absolute contraindication. It just tells you that the older you get, um, the, the more risk of uh, in, introducing hypothyroidism there is because there may be some uh, nodules. And also, um, if you're 60 years old, um, uh, your thyroid cancer may appear when you're 90, 95. So it's a long time to go. Okay. Uh, one last question we got in. Maybe I do want to, because this seems to be a question that, um, or this is a topic which seems to be very on the top of many of our minds. Uh, and that is, what should we do with patients who uh, have, were exposed to deadly dosages of radiation following military nuclear attacks? Um, how can you follow these people? Um, who will die in two or three days, or how can we know? I guess this uh, comes back to the presentation, the first slide you showed, or one of the first slides. Well, we don't know. <laughs> the problem is uh, when, the, when, when uh, the accident occurs, you have no information of how much radioactivity was uh, released, and you probably do, do not know exactly um, who got how much of radiation. And uh, the problem also is there's a latency. So the patients do not get the acute radiation syndrome uh, right the next second. Um, that develops over several days or, or weeks. So you just have to um, basically treat them and then you will see what happens. Um, but uh, if the radiation is very high, the likelihood of them not surviving is also very high. But basically, if I can summarize, if someone gets acute radiation, as long as he doesn't ingest it or doesn't have any radiating dust from it and he's brought to a tertiary center, uh, you can definitely treat him because he does not glow. Is that something yes. that, yeah, okay. Yes, that's, that, that okay. was my point, that if somebody has external radiation and not ingested anything, then you do not need to be concerned about contaminating yourself, but you have to make sure that that's really the case. Okay. May I add something? Maybe the important thing is if there's a radiation accident. I think that's the most important and um, most realistic part for us. And maybe not even uh, maybe not even a power plant, but in laboratory, for example, um, it's the task of either fire brigade or the uh, taking the emergency department to check for that with a radiometer. So to check if the patient if the patient is glowing. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, we should have uh, Geiger counters with us. Is that something we should have in the emergency kit? Um, this is more a question for Ben. Um, this is more a question for Ben than for me. <laughs> I don't carry one myself, to be very honest. I missed that one. I gotta put that down. <laughs> Gero, do you have one at home? Um, no, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but I have I, I have one in my departments, of course. But at home, I don't have one. Okay, good. 
Okay, I think it's uh, time we move on. Gerald, thank you very much. That was really, really enlightening. Um, thanks again for being with us. And I hope you can well, participate you in the discussions uh, that are coming up. I mean, uh, now we'll turn to uh, Ben uh, Tal, who is a physician working in the forefront of medicine, I would say, and uh, ambulance. And he has a lot to share. And of course, he will, I hope, tell us uh, what we should actually have in such an emergency kit. Depends on whether you're giving me your computer or not. Ah, yeah. yes. <laughs> One second. Um, here we go. I started the presentation. Awesome. So, just cut off. You should be set now. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So once again, thanks. Uh, thank you very much for having me. And um, this is my topic for tonight, the individual first aid kit. What should we have at hand? And I think um, we already caught a quick glance of how important it is to be prepared and to, to um, take this, this question into consideration. So what I'm covering here is what I'm going to talk about within the next 10 to 15 minutes. First of all, we already have been talking about the role of healthcare professionals um, when it comes to a crisis, actually. And um, having said that, what is a medical emergency more than a, than a daily crisis that can occur in our normal life as well? So what does first aid really mean in the context of treating a life-threatening medical emergency as healthcare professional? That's uh, what I want to discuss with you. I want to point out why standard first aid kits may be not enough to treat a patient as a healthcare professional, as well as why fancy medical emergency kits, on the other hand, may be too much, and why a well-packed IFAC might fill the gap. This is actually an IFAC. I brought one of those with me. We can then just um, take it out and look what's in there. So, first of all, those are the crises that we can face each and every day when we're out in our normal life. I just put a, some of the pictures together and just to, to give you also a quick glance of my job. Earlier this morning, um, we were called to a roadside accident in, in the city where a pedestrian has been hit by a car. And this occurred very near to a... Um, to an insurance company, an insurance, a general insurance company where there is also, also a doctor inside um, treating patients and his job is working for the insurance. So he's by far not, not a specialist in emergency medicine. And the situation was that uh, a pedestrian got hit by the car and some of the bystanders just ran right into that, into that home, into that house and to ask whether there is a doctor and um, dragged them out of his office onto the street and um, forced him to help these patients. And I think that makes it pretty much clear how um, important it is and, and how, how the, the, the people see us as healthcare professionals in those crisis situations. They, we are obliged to do superior first aid than nor the normal population. That's what they expect from us. And that's why um, we cannot emphasize enough how important it is to train those events. In this particular case, this um, doctor team was very highly educated. They had a, a, a small emergency bag that they were taking out and they were taking care fantastic. Uh, the, this um, patient was, um, was taking care fantastic. So um, hopefully she, she's going to be she's going to be well soon. And so are these five situations which you see in my presentation. Whether it's um, a dear colleague who who collapses, faints, falls off the of the desk due to some kind of internal medical condition, or if it is uh, if you're chilling out at the at, at the pool or at the sea with your with your dear family and and somebody's dragged out of the water uh, or a roadside accident or and the last picture, um, maybe, I, I think there are lots of doctors these days and healthcare professionals um, these days who would have never thought that they would um, be dragged into an into a, um, armored conflict. So um, those situations can occur and 
basically, if, if we are not talking war situations, but the normal daily emergency situations, we will have to take care of this patient until the medical trained personal, aka the ambulance, arrives at the scene. So um, normally this time, time slot that we will, we will be have to take care of the patient will not be more than 10 to 15 minutes. So within this time we will have to overcome our own startle reaction where we have to take, bring ourselves under, under control. We have, if possible, to ha have to have any kind of, of first aid or, or medical pack which we can bring to our patient to, to support him and to help him. And then um, support the ambulance team um, and, and also the emergency medical dispatch team um, to tell them how they can get as quick as possible to our patient. Mm -hmm. So within this t these 10 minutes after that, maybe the, the paramedics um, will, will um, need another 15 minutes at scene, 10 minutes for the transport. So it's a half an hour up to an hour till the patient um, gets to the hospital. And I think and I'm pretty convinced that these 10 minutes are the most important because the, the, the measurements and the steps in a severe emergency medical condition that um, are going to be performed on this patient within this, these 10, uh, 10 minutes are the most important because they really have the poten potential to save a life. So having that said, um, these people out of these situations, what are, what are they going to die of within minutes? We're not talking about um, those second level injuries that, that are severe, of course, and are catastrophic for the patient, but will not kill them within the first 10 minutes. That's for the first thing I can think of is cardiac arrest, of course, as the worst situation that can happen where we uh, are being obliged to perform high quality chest compressions and rescue breath, critical bleeding and shock situation where this, where patients literally bleeding to death, um, along with impaired airway and breathing function. And um, of course, hypothermia, especially um, in our region. Now, um, it, we have to take into consideration that a patient who has a um, body temperature of 35 degrees or less has a 50% higher mortality when he comes, when he's arriving at the, um, at the um, shock home, at the emergency, uh, emergency medical ward, especially in trauma. So hypothermia is also one thing that we can tackle within a couple of seconds. So. This is actually what a normal first aid kit hold, and um, this is what, <laughs> what is also often called as a boo-boo kit, because we see sorts of band-aids, we see um, small scissors, some tablets, but those are not the items, some iodine may maybe to disinfect the wound. This is a nice to have, and it's very, very important if you take your family out hiking, but it's not what you're gonna need if you, if you treat somebody who is in a life-threatening condition. And unfortunately, especially when you remember the picture of the roadside accident, accidents, those first aid kits, um, those are usually the kits that are located in the cars because um, the, manufacturer, um, the manufacturer of the car delivered it with such a first aid kit on board. And it's also um, demanded by law that one first aid kit is on board and um, yeah, it could be better for healthcare, at least for healthcare professionals. So we need an upgrade. And this is where we are talking within the, within the medical field, we're talking of two populations here. So on the one hand, there are the guys that are now packing their car and um, maybe also they're, they're ready to go bags with high sophisticated, fancy material like this emergency bag, which I put in here, maybe put some medication in and some syringes and you see there is stethoscope and, and um, a device to measure the blood pressure. But um, those fancy bags, they bring along uh, several problems. First of all, they're pretty expensive and it's very expensive to, to keep all the things always up to date in there, um, talking about expiry dates. 
Such a fancy bag is also pretty bulky. It takes a lot, a lot of space. Um, it is exposed to changing environment, environmental conditions. Like for example, in a car, it, it gets really hot, and maybe the, the especially the medication is being um, is being damaged. And after all, a big bag is not practical, and moreover, not at hand when you need it. You can have it in your car for a roadside accident, but um, for example, such a small pack like this IFAC, which I'm going to talk about later, I can take this, I can have this in my car. Um, when I'm out hiking, I just take this and put it into my, into my bag. I can put one of those into my medical office if I want. This is smaller and much more, um, and, and having that said, it's much more likely to have it at hand if I really need it. So. That's actually the IFAC, and IFAC stands for Individual First Aid Kit. It's, um, that's a personal device that has been introduced by the, by the military because it has the size that it can, it can be actually being carried individually by each soldier, as you see on the, on the lower picture down here. That's, by, by the way, exactly the same IFAC which I'm, which I'm going to show you. They come in different shapes and different variations. For example, on the, on the right side of the picture, you see one which, is, which can be directly mounted onto a headrest on the passenger seat. And they always have this shiny, shiny um, red handle, which makes it possible to easily deploy the whole kit. And um, for example, in such a situation, you won't have lot lots of time to open backpacks that um, might be, be um, attached to your plate carrier or to your, to your other piece of equipment. And um, for example, if you already used your own one and you see this red handle on, an, on another soldier, you can just drag it out. Now, um, as I said, there are dozens of suppliers of this IFAC. You just put the word IFAC and suppliers into Google and um, they do all the same. And it's always the same, the same principle. Um, it's just holding all those necessary things that we need to tackle all kinds of medical situations. Why I personally go for the IFAC is this is strictly tackles the motto, treat first what kills first. So, this is not a boo-boo kit, and especially, for example, when we're talking about ready bags in cars, it, it definitely makes sense to have a second kit which covers all the minor injuries and the smaller things. And the other thing what I like about it is it is kind of a healthcare professional standard first aid kit because you will find it, um, for example, wherever you place it, but you will also find it within the military, within the, the civil protection agencies, law enforcement. They all they always pack the same size and with the same items. Therefore, it is highly transportable and in comparison quite affordable. So for, ex for example, this pack which I, which I put together myself costs, like, uh, costs about 150 um, euros filled with all the things um, in it. So hence it is kind of spreadable throughout your personal life. This is actually the one I, I um, carry on my, on my backpack, which is on my passenger seat when I'm um, in charge with my car here in the Vienna Ambulance Service. I do also have such, uh, such an IFAC in my personal car, in my wife's car. And um, when I'm out and about and doing some adventure stuff in the woods or with my, with my kids, I just take this and throw it into my, into my backpack and have it at hand whenever I need it. So I would recommend let's just open it and see what's inside of it. Um, then now I don't need the computer anymore. Thank you very much. So first of all, you just take the big red handle and then you can, normally this is mounted, for example, with the Velcro on a backpack, and you just put it out. First of all, I have um, two pairs, of, or one pair of a nitrile examination gloves. In here, nitrile, because I always have to into color, uh, consideration that my patient suffers from, from latex allergy. And then I open it up, and I have everything at hand here, what I need. First of all, a rescue scissors, because... Can you hold the camera? Yeah, that? yeah, of course. There we go. Looks like this. So first of all, I have one pair of scissors, which should be able to, to cut clothes. And right inside here is a trauma tourniquet, which is a device that I can apply, for example, in, in um, extremity injury, 
that are severely bleeding, I won't have the time to put on pressure or whatever. I just just deploy it and put it onto an arm. And can you just open it so we can see? Yeah, yeah, of course. Exactly how it works. Okay, so this works like this. And you see, I'm, I'm nervous now because I'm holding this webinar, but in, in the field outside, because she's bleeding to death, she's really, literally bleeding to death. So I just put this through, mm -hmm. like for example, like this, put it around, close it, then it will go click, and then I can turn this little handle here and just fix it over here and the bleeding stopped. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is not very comfortable, but it's, it, this definitely is going to save her life. <laughs> How long can you have it on? Um, <laughs> that's not the question, because um, even if she loses her extremity, she's going to survive. Um, normally, you leave it on until you arrive at the hospital and uh, let the trauma surgeons do the dirty work. <laughs> so I think this is a, a very important issue that you should not be afraid that you're going to harm a limb if you leave it on, right? Uh, well, you can harm the limb, but it's what does she do with a harmed limb if she's dead? You know, so that doesn't that that doesn't help her. Here we have an Israeli bandage, which is kind of a um, special pressure bandage that I can apply to, to um, big wounds, along with some um, highly sophisticated um, and pretty modern combat gauze, which has a um, detergent and a clotting detergent implemented. So it will help to stop the bleeding by kicking off blood clotting. It's, uh, it's so hemostatic. Hemostatic, thank you very much. Yeah. And of course, what probably one of the most important devices, I do have two rescue blankets in here. I always carry two in my packs because I think um, keeping a patient warm, a severely injured patient warm, is one of the most important things that I could think of. And um, here we go, if you, if you imagine yourself going through Vienna after a long Saturday night and you find somebody who is intoxicated and in a bad situation, um, those two things are at hand and those are, those are the things you might need the most because he's, he's freezing himself to death. This is a chest seal which I can use for, for um, penetrating um, chest injuries like for example gunshot wounds or, or stabbing wounds. And um, it just prevents from getting air from the outside in, into the thorax and um, decreases the risk of a pneumothorax if, I, if being applied. Yeah. And then there are some smaller things, like for example, another, another gauze which I can put into, the, into a wound um, if the quick clot or the, the, com the combat gauze is not enough. There, this is like a little reserve if the patient is, is bleeding severely. And now I have two things in there that are very personal because um, normally you wouldn't find that in an IFAC, but I carry um, one um, dosage of um, adrenaline um, with me as well because this is the single one medication that is going in, in an anaphylactic shock that is going to um, save a patient's life when administered within um, minutes or seconds and I think all of the other medications can wait until the ambulance arrives, even pain medication and stuff like that. Then there are um, different things like for example there's a nasopharyngeal tube which I can put in to secure, um, to secure the airway or to kind, of, to kind of open the airway to, to be precise and a scalpel which I can use to, I as a, as a medical trained doctor can use, um, for example, for a precothereotomy or also um, for, a, um, for opening the chest when a patient is suffering with pneumotherics. That's, that kind of depends. And this is pretty much it. And I think with this at hand, I can tackle most of the situations. Okay. Well, I think this is a really, really big help. We've got some uh, comments coming in. Uh, in Ukraine, we provide assistance for refugees, doctors, and tutorial defense. Great needs in the formation of various first aid kits for these specific needs. Can you help with a list of these sets? I think we can maybe provide uh, yeah. a list of these uh, items uh, to a later, later point. Um, uh, uh, of course, we will put it maybe in the chat and so that you have that at hand. I think uh, that is definitely of help. I do want to now turn uh, to... Christoph Zöls, who is a surgeon and a wound specialist, because I'm sure he has something to add 
uh, to, to this because he sees it maybe from a little bit of a different perspective because he's a surgeon. <laughs> Uh, you need to turn Hello on to everybody. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Do you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, it's a very interesting uh, point of view because on one side you have the emergency doctor who is the first one at the place. On the other side, me as a vascular and general surgeon, I'm in the back of the hospital and therefore I have a lot more of time and possibilities for a perfect uh, aid. And one thing I'm not so happy about is the tourniquet, because we all know that there are a lot of problems existing due to this uh, first aid kit. Um, the other side is, you are absolutely right, uh, you, you give your limp for your life. And this, this is a kind of, of few, maybe outside in the, in the wood, uh, in the outpacks, but I don't think it's a good idea in the city. Uh, and therefore, maybe you should be aware and take care of taking a 20K. Mm. I think this is a, a very important point. Obviously, you know, there's uh, different approaches depending on where you are, where you are, if you are in a war zone or wherever you are. Maybe we can show a slide because, uh, again, in my research for this webinar, I found uh, the TCC guidelines. I didn't know they exist, but there is military guidelines of how you should go ab about in a military conflict. And as a matter of fact, uh, some of the soldiers, not done by all of them, but some of the soldiers actually wear the tourniquet uh, in a non, uh, of course, compressed form on their legs, just in case they do get injured, so someone just has to pull on them. What is your take on this? They um, already, this is very controversial. They, they already had some parts of uniform where it has also already been implemented inside of the uniform, but they figured out that it then is the problem that they that it's not adjustable anymore. I mean, I, I understand your, your concern about the tourniquet. Um, of course, one needs to know what he does with the, with the tourniquet, first of all. But um, especially if you think about bigger crisis, crises like, like the one we're facing in the Ukraine, this is also a device where as a healthcare professional, and we had this situation here in Vienna one and a half years ago, where, you might, where we, we as medical doctors here in the, of the general ambulance were facing the situation that we, have, that we had lots of patients due to the terrorist attack that, that happened here. And um, what do you do if you have 10 patients at once? You cannot go and just apply one of these on every patient, whereas the others bleed to death. So this is also a device which, which is highly recommended in catastrophe medicine mm -hmm. and if you have, if you have several patients. Yeah. I mean, there was another question concerning this set, which also was also reg uh, regarding the chest seal, um, and I hope I pronounce it correctly mm -hmm. now. Yeah. Uh, how great is the problem of inducing attention pneumothorax? With the chest seal, I, I I don't think that's a big that's a, that's a big issue, mm -hmm. but that brings me to another point which I want to throw into the basket. Um, for example, short before Christmas, I had a, a, a victim uh, who has been um, stopped by her stabbed by her husband, mm -hmm. and she has she had lots of different injuries. See, she had different um, stabbing wounds on her extremities, and also a chest wound, also an abdominal wound, and and some wounds on the side of her legs. So which are you going to tackle first? And that's an also a very handy device. You can put a tourniquet on on one, the other, and the, the third size, and then, then taking care of the other more life-threatening conditions. So, I think that's the most important part is, um, it is training. Yeah? Of course, if there's one patient, he has a wound, a cut in the arm, he doesn't need a tourniquet, he's pre he needs pressure on it. Yeah? And of course, it happens that lesser trained uh, medics maybe use it because they have this good tool. But that's not a four. But if you have a patient which is not, who is instable, where you don't have time to, where you have more, more patients, then the tourniquet is a, is, a is a proven concept and it comes from the military where it's running around because they only have time for a tourniquet because they have to return fire potentially. So I think, it's, I think both sides are true. And training is the key, of course. Yeah? Sure. Uh, let me say you one word. Uh, the main important thing with the tourniquet is to stop the arterial bleeding. That means you need a lot of pressure. 
Otherwise, if you don't have enough pressure to stop the arterial bleeding, you only stop the venous backflow, which causes a congestion and continues the bleeding. So you lose a lot of blood more uh, thinking that you have done a right thing with a tourniquet. So I totally agree to you. If you take a tourniquet, it's no problem if you are familiar to work with. And this means that you have a training. I, and I think we cannot emphasize this enough. And this brings me to like the, the, the bottom point of, of all these efforts. These, these, all these devices, every one of it needs training. And I want to just bring your thoughts back to the beginning of my presentation where I said, as healthcare professionals, it doesn't matter whether you're a medical doctor, a nurse, a paramedic, or even a medical technician, people around us rely on us in performing better first aid. And in my point of view, after serving 20 years within, within the field, I am convinced that each and every doctor, nurse, and, and um, um, healthcare provider needs to be able to perform high quality chest compressions, to do a basic CPR, to put on a bandit the right way, um, maybe turn on a tourniquet and, and just, or, and of course, wrap the patient in the right manner into a rescue blanket so he will survive these first 10 seconds. That's the least standard that, that one will have to um, accept of a healthcare professional. For example, in, in, in England, um, you cannot work within the field without doing an advanced life support cor course every two years. And if you won't pass, you're out of the hospital because they see how important it is that, that we are trained. And I think there is lots of air <laughs> in the upper direction in, in, many, in many countries. And each and one of us holds the responsibility to, to train himself. Alexander, how do you see this? Because obviously a uh, medical university is strongly <laughs> engaged in uh, training students and medical personnel. Do you think we should go even further? Concerning first aid or uh, advanced yeah, aid? Well, I would say advanced aid. Advanced aid. Um, first of all, I think, Ben, you're totally right. Every healthcare provider, need, and irresponsive is every radiologist emergency, needs to be a perfect first responder. And that's for cardiac attack, for bleeding. That's the baseline. Yeah? And um, that, that's that's a, that's a, that's already a way to go. We don't need we don't we don't need um, that every healthcare provider is an emergency physician who is um, doing a thoracostomy outside outside. But perfect first aid, yeah, life saving measures within the first ten to twenty minutes. That's what every should know. First of all, to help the people, and secondly, as multipliers, yeah? mm -hmm. because how should we tell people go. Do not on, do not only one first first aid course for for, uh, for your driving license yes. and then that's it for your life uh, if we are not able to do it. Um, maybe also adding to this, yeah, um, especially in the current situation, would you and maybe also later on Tal have one specific tip or maybe two for frontline paramedics? Get prepared. Go to YouTube. Look, you know, I, I think preparation is everything. It's also, that's what I wanted to throw back to our trauma surgeon. Mm -hmm. um, I think also that a medical doctor needs to be able to put a couple of stitches in. And if you forgot how, how, how to do it, just go to YouTube or book a course in an in a e-learning platform, for example. Yeah? You, can, you can get lots of tons of skills out there. It's everything out there. Uh, Tal, is there anything you would add to this? Um, I guess um, training again is um, very important and I guess I would probably think uh, it's also important to not be afraid to act. Um, I mean especially people who are now in a conflict where they didn't have time to train I guess uh, sometimes you'll just have to train while you're doing it. I guess that's that's uh, one of the bottom lines here. Um, good I think we can now go uh, to the next presentation and we will now come to the surgical topic um, of how do you actually manage wounds. So uh, let's now have um, Dr. Christoph Zöls. He is a cardiovascular surgeon as you've already heard and he is uh, based in Graz and he of course has 
tons of experience on how to treat wounds. And um, Christoph, can you give us just the basics of uh, what should we know about wound uh, management? I hope I can do this. <laughs> I'll try it. I hope I can start the presentation. Sorry, takes a little time. Do you see the presentation now? It's coming up. Do you, you see it? Yes, we see it. We see it. We hear you. Okay, okay, okay. On the end, you can hear me. Well, that's fine. So, uh, for me, uh, like all the other speakers said, and thereby many thanks for this invitation to this very extraordinary uh, webinar. The main topic for me is not to only save the patient's life, you have to be safe for your own life too. And therefore, let me allow to to give you the, this first uh, uh, picture, check your own vaccinations to be sure that you don't get any harm. The other thing is that uh, you should try a standard precaution to protect the patient and the staff, reducing cross infections. And how can you do this? You do this with a good hygiene, with aseptic techniques, with a personal protective equipment, you see on the picture and a clean procedure. These are main important things because uh, solving your own life too. In a very short time, principles of wound therapy contain of three parts. The first is the cleansing of the wound. The second one is the debridement and the third one is the dressing. So as the, the four speakers told you already, Everybody should do this, and he, he needs not to be afraid of doing something wrong. The only wrong thing he can do is not to do anything. So first of all, try to clean the wound, remove the debris and the toxic substances. Uh, you can do it mechanical with a gauze or with a fluid. And afterwards, you can take some antiseptics to clean and uh, uh, try to Sorry. Uh, can you just advance the slides because I think uh, we're stuck on the first slide. Just go to the next slide. It doesn't work. Ah, uh, yes, we only see I the one to. slide. I, I think you just need to advance the slide. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So I I try to go back. You see the second one now? Uh, we see the slide just to be safe. Okay. Now, do you see the principles of wound therapy? Uh, not yet. Uh, it's not here yet. And maybe it just takes some time. Maybe there's a delay. Just keep on talking. I guess it will come. Okay. So. First, we talked about the cleaning of the wound. I already said to remove the debris and toxic substances. The second one is the debridement. That means that you remove the necrotic, infected, or damaged tissue until you have a healthy surrounding tissue uh, exposed. And therefore, and this is also a thing you should not be afraid of, the wound groom should bleed a little because this is the only uh, secure sign for you that you did a good debridement. And after this debridement, you can also use uh, antiseptic procedure. And the third one is after cleaning the wound and debrided it, you do a dressing on it. And which should the dressing have? Ideally, it should allow effective oxygen perfusion for regenerate, regenerating cells. It should ease the pain. It, so, it should absorb exudate. It should help you with debridement. It also should promote healing, protect from infection, reduces stress for the patient, and protect the surrounding healthy skin. So which kind of, of features we have? We have antimicrobials for cleaning. You know them as antibiotics or disinfectants or antiseptics. For antibi antibiotics uh, or antiviral or antifungal agents or antiparasitic ones, 
you need to know exactly the pathogen to be sure to take the right pill against the pathogen. And therefore, you need a swap. And this is something you don't have in the emergency case. So you have to have a kind of uh, conscious and knowledge about several wound infections to take the right um, agent. Desinfectants you should not use. You only use it for sterilizing surfaces, but don't use it for the body because they are very toxic to the tissue. You only can take antiseptics. Antiseptics don't harm the tissue and they inhibit the growth of microorganisms. So which kind of antiseptics you can use easily? The first one is yoda. It's very effective against all bacteria species associated with wound infections. And, and this is very important, it has a wide range of fungus inside because up to 25% in chronic wounds you will find fungus. It's also against yeast, protozoa, and virus. And it is very effective. That means you only need a short time of putting the antiseptic on the wound. In about one or two minutes, you have already all the effect you want to have. A second one, also very moderate and very comfortable, is octinidine dihydrochloride. It's also against the bacteria and very quick effective also one or two minutes of lasting and you have the same effect. Very often used is PHMB, polyhexamethylene biguanide. Uh, it has a, well, a very wide range against bacteria, yeasts, and fungus, but it has a slow effectiveness. It, you need a time for up to 15 minutes of working because the toxicity for the tissue is very low and also for against the bacteria, so you need a lot of wrong uh, need a lot of wrong time for working. Just to be sure, you can hear me. I can hear you very good. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, the the last one I know from my beginning as a, as a surgeon is sugar. We don't take sugar; we take honey because honey is older than sugar and it's very perfect in in cleaning and antiseptic a wound because it's a, it has a hygroscopic effect that means it dries out the wound. And you have a presence of hydrogen peroxide and hydrogen peroxide is a, a substance against the, the breathing chain and the living bacteria. So you can damage the bacteria with, with the peroxide. Another very positive effect is to lowering the pH Normally, bacteria like alkaline pH, up to 7, 7.5 or more. But with a, with a honey, you go up to 4 or 5 pH. That means you, are, you have an acid on the wound ground which kills the, the bacteria. But this causes pain that you have to consider. Uh, in some honeys, you have a manuka factor. This is a kind of antibacterial peptide, which is... Uh, helpful. And if you don't have honey, you can have all the same effects with icing sugar. I remember we had on our, our uh, uh, trolley for, for the wound dressings, we had a package of icing uh, sugar on and we put on even in, in children into the wounds to have these effects of hygroscopic and lowering pH. But don't forget, it causes pain. So you see the hygroscope? No, no, don't see it. I don't know if you see it, but I have it. Yeah, on I have the slides here, so you can just. We see the slides. Oh, that's great. That's fine. So you see the perfect slides. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, if you go to the antibiotics, uh, for me it is very important to face this this sentence: local problems in wounds should be solved locally. And problems with a systemic infection signs with a sub. Uh, a systemic inf uh, inflammatory response syndrome, then you do it generally. That means for me, then it's the first and best thing to take antibiotics. Not if you have just a wound like you see on the right hand side with a, with a, a small amount of bacteria on it. That is not 
necessarily treated with antibiotics. For me, just uh, an easy handling uh, and the suggestion for treatment are oral antibiotics because you can usually, uh, easily apply them. First choice for me is a penicillin because you have also a bone penetration. A second choice are folic acid antagonists because due to the fact that there were so many uh, antibiotics uh, developed in the last time, the folic acid antagonists uh, were not that much in, in treatment. So with a treatment supreme, you can have a chance if you have a penicillin allergic or uh, uh, something uh, resistance against penicillin to treat also Enterobacter, Colis, Staphylococcus, and Proteus. Third line should be the fluoroquinolones, even if we know that we have the problems with the tensions and the tendons that may rupture if you yeah. have a long uh, period of, of using them. But sometimes, like saving the limb for uh, uh, giving the limb for life, you take a fluoroquinolone if it's the only chance to get uh, um, a healthy patient needing antibiotics. And even don't forget the metronidazole because you have also uh, a good uh, awareness against ana anaerobic bacteria. So what should addressing the, the third part of dressing be in crisis? You should have a fluid control. It means, on the one hand, if you have a very wet wound, it should absorb the, the liquid. Or if you have a dry wound, you sh it should donate, donate the fluid back to the, to the wound groom. It should have a low adherence. That means a painless removal. It should have a, micro a microbial control. And it should have a hemostatic effect, as we heard before. And maybe some of them also have an effect in debridement. For me, the best dressing in crisis should be an alginate because it's a polysaccharide. You remember the sugar from the brown algae, and this uh, stuff is combined with calcium. Uh, calcium is very, very uh, effective in local hemesthesia because it activates the extrinsic system of hemesthesia. And with a, with an alginate, you can stop even moderate bleedings by putting some pressure on and the alginate, and you will stop the bleeding. It also can induce wound healing. You can combine it with silver, and you can combine it with anesthetic or antiseptic gel, which is also very useful for helping. The dressing in crisis. Uh, you need a fatty ointment around the wound edge to protect the, the healthy skin. And you cover it with a small layer, maybe a cotton gauze, a foam, which has a good accident management, a protection, warming, padding. And you can take cotton wool, and I prefer also short stretch bandage to cover the, the dressing on the right position. So should we go on with bullets, bombs, and blasts, or stop? No, no, I think that's uh, good. Uh, it's re really interesting to, to have your suggestions. Maybe I'll ask a question intermittently. Um, uh, all these bandages, where do you get them? Is there something like um, um, a survival kit, a surgical survival kit that you can simply buy with all this inside? Or uh, do you need to have the name of the fabric? And we got a question, um, what about proto Protonosan as an antiseptic. Uh, um, you you get it Pontosan. in the in the pharmacy. We, okay. You get it in the pharmacy. You can buy it there. Even you get it by recept uh, in Austria. Yeah, so you can have it at home. And uh, Cotan is also a, a good antiseptic. Uh, uh, the main thing is there are up to two thousand products existing for wound therapy. And it's uh, rather difficult to say this one is good and this one not. So I only am focused on an easy way and an easy handling and a good effect. And these three or four suggestions are my favorites. Everybody who is familiar to wound therapy can use something else. 
but the main thing is that he should know what he is using and he should know why he is using. So everything would be okay. Okay. Well, then maybe you can continue with bullet bombs and blast injuries because obviously this is something that is of concern to um, okay. some parts of the world. I start. I start. Do you see? No, I'm not asking. Slides, that. all good. You don't see. Okay, all good, so I have them. The, uh, the main important thing is that you have to compare low velocity versus a high velocity uh, missile. Low velocity means less than 400 meters per second, and you have the laceration and the crush along the track of the, of the missile. Normally, these are uh, uh, pistols or something like that you only have normally an entrance wound and no exit wound. And compared to this, you have um, a only short kind of necrosis you can see. And normally you don't have a lot of problems in the surrounding. On the other side, when you have a high velocity uh, missile, it's up to one or 2000 meters per second you have a temporary cavitation in the tissue. That means you don't only have the necrosis around the track, you have it around the surrounding. And maybe this uh, will be uh, seen by you after a time delay. It's not at the moment seen like uh, the, the, cavi uh, the, the necrosis on the track. And this causes a problem. And therefore you have a very good do and don't with a, with a bomb and blast injuries. You should do a general, generally incise the skin to have a good, a good overview. You should incise also the deep fascia widely because you have to remove the muscles with, when they swell. Otherwise, when you, when you don't cut in the, the deep fascia, the swelling can cause harm of the nerves and of your vessels. You should identify neurovascular bundles for a later recovery. You should excise all that muscle and very important, you should remo remove all indriven clothing because this can uh, cause a lot of infection. And the main important thing is to leave the wound open. You don't close the wound, yeah? And the record of damage is also a good help. So what are you not allowed to do? Don't excise too much skin. Don't practice a keyhole surgery. That means you don't be, uh, you are afraid of open uh, the, the entrance uh, wound instead of doing harm. That's not, uh, not right. You have to open to look inside up to the, the, the deep fascia to go inside and open it. Don't stitch tendons and nerves because they will uh, be necrotic later on. So it doesn't uh, bring you any such, uh, support. Only definite, uh, identify them and wait for a, a later uh, procedure. Don't remove bone. This is also very important because you shorten the limb or the, or the arm or, or something like that. Try to remove uh, the bone fractures to the bone uh, skin, put them together and try to do a fixation uh, or splinting to keep them in the right position. Don't close the wound and don't pack the wound tightly. So for my suggestion, the emergency kit should be, <laughs> um, uh, you should find also inside uh, gloves, mask, protection clothes, we have seen. Maybe a surgical equipment with a tweezer and a scissor, a surgical knife uh, was uh, in, the, in the kit before. Maybe you have inside needles, syringe, sutures, infusion sets, and a sterile cover. Maybe you have inside a cotton gauze, plasts, foam, alginate, cotton wool, short stretch bandage. Then you need antiseptic solutions, whatever you want. You can have them as a fluid or a, as a gel. And a suggestion uh, we heard before, you should have at home clean water. Clean water is also possible for wound cleansing. 
if you take a sparkling water, you know you have a lower pH than a, a not sparkling water. It's up to 6, 6.5. And then you have an antiseptic effect by cleansing. So uh, if you have enough water at home, you can use it as antiseptic solution. And don't forget the antibiotics for oral use, painkillers, local anesthesias, on gels and pulse infusions. Then, if you can work with, have an infusion set at home with electrolytes, glucose, and blood expander, and don't forget high caloric nutrition. So, many thanks. I hope you are happy about. Well, we definitely are. I think this is really, really important information, concisely. Uh, but I think. Ben has a question. Um, you as a surgeon, um, what would be your number one IV antibiotic which you would hold in your, in your doctor's office? If you, for example, are on the countryside and you face a crisis and it's highly likely that you will have to treat those kind of patients. Uh, I mean, there, there are going to be some patients who are not conscious enough to swallow the oral medication. So what is the number one? Sure. Um, I, would I, would, I would like uh, penicillin with, uh, with combinations. Okay. okay. Uh, we got some questions in here, again from the auditorium. One is, um, how much fluid would you recommend for washing the wound? <laughs> so much as needed. So you would put it, uh, the patient's hand, for example, under the water faucet and just let it run? Uh, if you know that it's a clear water, it's no problem because you can take afterwards an antiseptic mm -hmm. and every problem should be lo uh, solved. Mm -hmm. uh, a main problem is that people are aware of water, but we know already that there are so many countries existing which only can do uh, a wound cleaning by water. They purify it or they have uh, clean water out of the bottle. But you can also uh, reduce the amount of water by making the gauze wet with a with the water, put it on the wound, and wait a little. But it depends on the on the um, dirt you have on the wound. Sometimes you have to be mechanically by cleaning. Then you take it for showering or something like that. If you don't have too much uh, dirt on the wound, you take a gauze put it, uh, uh, fill it with, with a water uh, and an antiseptic or something like that and put it on and wait for uh, up to five or ten minutes. Then you have also a cleansing effect. Uh, and as I, did I get you correctly, preferable uh, it would be to have carbonated water? It's better than a, a not carbonated one, yeah. We got one more question. You have a lower pH. Okay. So, uh, we also got a question maybe for both of you uh, and also for, uh, for Ben. What do you do if you have an injury of the carotid artery? I mean, uh, how long will you survive in the first place? And uh, you would probably not use a tourniquet, would you? Um, no, I mean, there are models where you could apply the Israeli bandage yeah. um, onto, onto a bleeding in, in this region. But I think if he really has his or, or she really has her, her um, carotid artery, cut through. I think the only thing you could try is direct pressure, but I think especially within a combat scenario, she's gonna, not going to have the best cards, I guess. Christoph, what is your take? Uh, I loved to operate carotid arteries, and therefore I know it's very difficult, because if you put on too much pressure, you can make a ischemic problem in the brain. If you put on to less pressure, you have a lot of bleeding there and you kill the patient. So it's uh, somehow being on a, on a, on a wire uh, where it can fall on both sides. Uh, if you have a big heart, you put in your finger into the, the bleeding, try to feel the pulsation and put it on in a severe pressure, not too much, so much that you see that is not much blood coming out of the wound, but not too much that he doesn't get any harm in the brain. But if you have more than one patient, you, ha you are in a big problem because this one is not the one you could uh, save his life. I have two more uh, types of injuries which I want to cover. One is pneumothorax. Uh, maybe yeah. you can comment on that. This is something that First of all, how do you detect it in the field? And um, 
should anybody sh treat it and what you need to treat it? Uh, pneumothorax, uh, traumatic pneumothorax uh, is the problem when you have air between the lung and the chest wall. And with any breath, the air between the lung and the chest wall gets more so the, the, the lung will collapse and this causes the problem. But normally, if you have a penetrating wound or fractures with, uh, with, uh, with the ribs, you see uh, a strange kind of breathing. That means if you breathe in, the, the normal lung side will increase, but the side with the pneumothorax will decrease because uh, all the mediastinum and all inside the, the thorax will go on the, on the other side. So you have uh, as, uh, uh, atypic uh, breathe in and breathe out uh, movement, which can give you um, a hint that you have um, uh, a pneumothorax. And if it's so, you only puncture it with a not armed uh, syringe. So you can put out the air between the lung and the chest wall. And normally you need a hypertensive vent a ventilation, then you can recover and refill the collapsed uh, lung, and you have also a good um, uh, work of this kind of, uh, of, of this lung. Maybe concerning the detection, um, well, in hospital detection is more or less easy. easy. Uh, chest ray or even better ultrasound. Um, outside in the field, and also another crisis, um, the only hemothorax uh, which I have to treat is tension pneumothorax. And that's when the patient is instable. And when the patient is instable, and I, I think there could be pneumothorax, then I have to react as a healthcare, as a trained healthcare professional. Yeah? Um, if the patient is stable, yeah, then I don't have to treat it immediately. Thanks for your comment about ultrasound. I think this is very important. <laughs> this is uh, not many areas now, I think, where ultrasound comes into place, but uh, this pneumothorax is definitely an indication for ultrasound. It can really help. But I want to pass maybe just uh, this question to Ben. Do you have anything to add to this? Or? I fully agree. Okay. I fully agree with what has been okay, said then before. Let me come to the last uh, question regarding uh, injuries, burn and fire. Um, what do we need to do? Um, can you give us some guidance here? I think you need to turn on your microphone. Uh, we, we're not hearing you at the moment. Okay, sorry. Do yeah. you hear me yes, now? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. I, I made three slides. Do you want to see them? Uh, yes, I hope we can see them. Okay. I try to do it once again. Do you see them? It's how to treat, uh, uh, treat burns. Good. Burns. Yeah, great. Okay. Uh, the main thing is uh, the three persons on the right-hand side. You see the rule of nines from Wallace, which gives you a good overview of how many surfaces is burned. You know, front is 18%, back is 18%, every arm is 9 every limb is 18 and the, the head is 9%, and the genital is 1%, and all together is 100%. But if you see the child or the infant, you see how you have a decrease uh, concerning the head and uh, uh, also the limbs. Yeah. So it's very important to have uh, about an amount of how many surfaces you have burned. And then you can help with the surface of the hand of the patient because the surface is about 1% of, of, of the surface of the body. So you can measure it for approximately to have an overview. What is the first aid? You remove the patient from the source of heat. This is very uh, important. Even in electric burns, you try to switch off the electrical supply. Then you apply cold, clean water soaks of the affected areas and you change it up to one or three minutes, even if you have a chemical burn. And to transport the patient, you have to do it with a great care because everything hurts a lot. 
the severity of the burn depends on the extent of body surface burned. Therefore, we have the rule of mines. It depends on the depth, on the causative agent, also on the age of the patient, on the associated injuries and illness, and if you have a respiratory tract burn too, this causes much more problems. So the immediate treatment, and therefore you need the equipment, should be fluid. And for adults, you should have 1.5 liter colloid solution for every 10 percentage of burn within 24 hours. And for children, you take a plasma. Yeah, therefore you have to know 40 milliliter per kilo, kilograms is the, the main solution you have to take and you take it uh, for every 15 percentage of burned within 24 hours. You remove also here the adherent clothing with warm sterile water. Blisters you find, clean blisters, you can let them. You need not to rupture them because the blister skin is a better uh, dressing than you would have. Tetanus and antibiotic prophylaxis you need uh, at hand. Nutrition is very important. And the burn dressing uh, should be placed on. For, for me, the best dressing, which is produced in uh, the United States, is Plurigil. Otherwise, you should take some water-based um, uh, dressings which are normally based on the gauze or, or uh, something like that you put on directly on the wound. And as we heard before, radiation burn, uh, burns have also a, a, a necrosis which it evolves, but it evolves more slowly and deeply than a burn uh, necrosis. And uh, this is a uh, main thing which causes the problem. So I, I hope I'm here again. Absolutely. Do Thanks. I think me? this uh, this was perfect. I think this gives us a great overview. Um, I think at this point, I need to say goodbye to Ben because Ben is actually um, already... On duty. Yeah, he needs, no, <laughs> he needs to go to, uh, to work because he's going to save some more lives today, I guess. I have to bring the IFAC back to the world, yeah. Okay, <laughs> so he is on call today. So thanks again for having Thank you. Thank you very much for Great presentation me. and hope to have you at some later time, maybe again. Anytime you need. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you. much. Bye. Okay. Uh, now let me uh, turn to the last presenter, um, to Alexander, who is a colleague uh, from uh, the Emergency Department of the Medical University of Vienna. Um, and um, uh, Alexander, I think I'll just open the presentation for you. One second. Alexander is... Um, of course, an emergency medical physician, but he's also strongly involved in uh, the topic of, let me see, where is the presentation here? Oh, I think I lost my... Is this yours? No. Nope. It's not yours. This is not yours. Yeah, Just uh, quickly one remark from my side. There are, of course, a lot of questions still open when it comes to first aid and first aid kits and what to do in field in comparison to what to have at home. Uh, this is something we are definitely addressing later on, um, probably um, also in a short newsletter or similar, um, to also uh, answer those questions. I would also have another question for Dr. Porenta that came in. Um, um, basically, this is more of a pharmaceutical question, which is how la long can the iodine tablets last from manufacturing and how to store them? Um, actually, you can store them just in the, in the closet. There's no specifics about it. And uh, uh, they last around five to 10 years. You have to look at the packaging. Um, you can can swap it in the in the pharmacy if you want to, uh, in the schools that it's done automatically in Austria. 
you. And additionally, there were also some questions about protective clothing. You already mentioned some materials that are useful. What is actually really useful, uh, like in a non-supercritical country like Austria, to have at home? Uh, the question is what, what material is to have critical at home? Yeah, that um, was not too, too precise. I'm meaning uh, <laughs> the protection suits yeah, and gas masks no. and whatever people are buying now. What does really make sense? Uh, I don't think anything makes sense, um, really, because there's not going to be a huge fallout uh, of uh, things that require you to, to wear protective gowns. So uh, it depends on the position. If you are a, um, a physician out working, um, it may be different. But for the general population, um, the only thing that is uh, really suggested to have at home is the, 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 the tablets. There's no special equipment that you can, uh, can use. Many thanks. Yeah. Ready to go? So we have the presentation now. Please, Alexander. I'm here, um, I will present to you um, possibilities of disaster relief in the hospital. We heard a lot now about um, for, uh, the, uh, as, as first, respo first responder work and the work in the pre-hospital setting. And I will give you a short glimpse um, how hospitals prepare for disasters and emergencies. We start with a little definition. I know it's semantic, but in my view, the word disaster is the mo one of the most abused words also for uh, medical staff, at least in Middle and Western Europe, where we don't see a lot of uh, medical disasters. Emergency is quite clear. It's an event where we need emergent an emergency response to avoid um, damage to a person. The escalation is the mass casualty inc incident. It's an incident which that amount of patients where locally that you, with your normal resources and your routine procedures, you can't manage them. That means you can manage them locally, but you will have to activate additional forces, for example, in ambulances, command and control. You will have might have to, you, you might have to stop uh, sta standard operating procedures for that. Um, and the disaster is a serious disruption in the function of community with losses of life um, and other things, which exceed the possibility of a community, a country, to cope with it. So. Of course, this is also is a political um, a, a view because if you, if for example, a country declares a disaster, that means that funds can be made free for it. But as we we, we see disasters, floodings last years was also a lot in Europe. But most of us have never seen a medical disaster. What are now disasters and emergencies? above our normal cope of work for which hospitals do prepare. Mainly two big groups. The first is the mass casualty incident. Either to the major accidents, we have heard that from Tal in the, let's say, Western world, that's mainly the bus, uh, the, the bus accident with 20 to 50 uh, injured people. Yeah? That may be mass events. We spoke about panic. Yeah? And of course, natural disasters. For example, after an earthquake, when it will be a, dis a disaster. And unfortunately, even in Europe and uh, in rising numbers, terrorist incidents. We should not forget what, what an important thing is failure of critical in infrastructure, either at the hospital itself, because hos hospitals don't tend not to work very well without electricity, without water, without supply, and of course, in the region where you do work. And an ominous word is the blackout. Yeah? Um, we have been told for, for years that the blackout will be there, not for 24 hours, for up to 72 hours, maybe even weeks. And then in decreasing order, we have hazmat and CRBN incidents. I mean, incidents with hazardous material or chemical, chemi chemical biological, radioactive or nuclear substances yeah? that might be either after an accident in a laboratory or um, either either an accident, so at a power plant, or more commonly, uh, for example, in a laboratory. And then, of course, suspected cases of life-threatening, highly contagious diseases. Um, that's not now not COVID, as problematic it is, but, for example, Ebola or MERS. 
in hospitals which are not equipped for that primarily, and for example in Vienna that's one hospital, in most communities there won't be any hospital, if I have suspected cases of a highly contagious, life-threatening disease, that's not a disaster of course, but that will need us to cope with it and to invoke special protocols, which hopefully we'll have. And for example, on the other side, I was just scrolling through the internet about worldwide um, uh, events of mass, mass casualties. And for example, on this homepage, the Journal of Emergency Medicine, they have a couple of things. Every day, in a, every, every other day, somewhere in the world, there is an incident of mass casualty. Of course, it depends always on the infra infrastructure. In the big city, three um, life-threatening injuries and maybe 10 to 15 non-life-threatening injuries won't be a real mass casualty because they will be distribu distributed to uh, different hospitals and they will cope with it in their routine. In a smaller town, for example, this is a mass casualty incident and the only hospital which is there will have to invoke special protocols. So for a hospital, what are the goals? And the main goal, for me at least, is maintaining our treatment capacities because uh, uh, disaster and emergency protocols are not our main goal. We have work to do. We're treating patients and we should treat them as long as possible. Of course, if we have, if we have so many new patients, then we'll go to triage and then we will have to stop treatment or postpone treatment at least. But our first goal is to maintain normal treatment as long as possible. And then of course there is, we have to expand our capacities. If we get more patients than we normally cope with, we need more personnel. We need more, we, we, we need more infrastructure. We might need more operating rooms. And of course, there's a thing, resource efficiency. Um, it's not helpful if we use all our resources that we have in the first hours because maybe what we are not used to in Middle Europe, uh, this is an incident which takes hours, days, weeks, then we will have to keep up our work for the next days. So we can't call in every physician, every nurse who is on call. We will, might need some of them the day after tomorrow, the day after tomorrow. Yeah? And after coping with the incidents, we should return to our routine operations because, we go back to one, we have to care for our routine patients. And so it's a cycle which is not for the hospital, which is a cycle for um, all emergency care and preparations. It starts with preparation, hopefully. Hopefully you have anticipated um, scenarios and have prepared for them. But um, the quality of preparation is always tested in the incident itself. So then there is the incident and then you have to respond. After the, after the, the incident has been worked up, you go back to normal, to, to no, to normal workup and then you have to do two things. First of all, you have to evaluate what you have done because all scenarios you have planned, the a real scenario will is the test on your preparedness. And the second thing is prevention. In the hospital itself, we can't do a lot of prevention. We can preparation, and that's our job. We can't prevent uh, exams. But for example, but that's from a municipal uh, uh, level. For example, Ben, in his capacity as a senior emergency physician, he's not only treating, he's also advising the city. And if, for example, we get a mass sport event after COVID and when Vienna will land, let's say, another European World Championship final, um, their planning is needed to avoid a mass casualty and to alienate the, the, the consequences. So preparation. So why do we prepare? Well, because it's not necessary, but preparation is, should, is in most countries will be mandated, yeah? either locally or, uh, or, or, or on a national level. And even for those countries where there might not be any mandate, um, there are guidelines, and especially the World Health Organization has published a couple of guidelines and also introduced a couple of course formats uh, for all countries, but especially for lesser developed or developing countries. So check into your intra if you have intranet in your hospital, check. There will be some kind of emergency plan. It might be called a disaster plan, emergency plan, special plan. It might be hundreds of pages or just two pages. We will do it. Um, but most hospitals will have something. Yeah. And what should be done is we need plans because in order to be able to train uh, and then to have the response, we sh have to start with, with a plan. Of course, most things we plan will not go the way we have planned it, but without plan, we don't know where to start. So 
the things we have to change from a normal from a normal workup and norm, normal procedures. First of all, we need some kind of a command structure, and that's a problem in uh, in in, me in, med in medical scenes because although we have sometimes a very steep hierarchy. Um, in my experience, medical personnel and especially doctors are not used uh, to be to work in an environment with multiple incidents, multiple patients, where they got actually a military-like command structure. And in the mass casualty, a military-like command structure is the only way to go. Yeah? Uh, so there has to be training, there has to, this structure has to be established, and the personnel has to be trained in it. Then we need to search. Yeah? Um, when we determine we were not able to cope with this incident with our common structure, we need more staff and more personnel. Normally, we'll, there will be an automated um, alarming device for this, or plan. And we, we might need to search an infrastructure. So for example, we might need to stop or postpone planned non-essential uh, opera operations. There need to be treatment paths, so we have to de have de define where will our patients uh, enter the hospital, how will they be triaged, and where will they go afterwards. And the big thing is, even without our armed conflict, security, because we have to secure the critical infrastructure of a hospital. First of all, to show patients to guarantee that our entry points are the only ones. For example, general hospital in which I'm working, a hospital with roughly 2,000 beds, we have dozens of, uh, of entry points. Those entry points have to be limited to one or two in an emergency. Um, actually, now we're used to it to the, the, due to the COVID pand and pandemic, but that's something we need in a mass, mass casualty because for us it's defined with one uh, entry point for patients and two point entry points for personnel. And we need the infrastructure. We have, we have to have it and we have to secure it. And a very important thing for, uh, for hospitals, of course, is electricity. So every every hospital should have, and I believe every hospital will have some kind of, uh, of backup generator or generators, but uh, they only work as long as they are uh, as as they are maintained and as long as they have fuel. Normally, the fuel workup is for 24 to maximum 72 hours, and then there comes the big point of training. Yeah? The plan alone is worthless if we don't train it and if we don't reevaluate it. And the problem is. The training takes time away from our normal work, and uh, uh, the, the chiefs in hospitals they don't always like that. Yeah? So they tend to, they tend to put down the time down to, to the training and make it easier. So, for example, we all, we have once a year before COVID we had the training, but mainly arrival patients, administration, and triage. It's good, it's important, but it's not enough because the patient work of the patient flow and the communication flow will be the important thing and that's the point where, where, where we will get problems. And then of course we have to evaluate our plans. For example, we had planned a big, uh, a big training with 400 patients where actually General Hospital would have keyed any operation non-lethal for two days um, to, imp to try to test our current plans and to re-evaluate re them. Unfortunately, the plan uh, was end of 2020, and you can, I think you will, might guess why we didn't do it. But hopefully in some years, we will go back to this plan. The response starts with the alarm, and there must be some kind of a protocol who is taking the alarm. Ideally, the alarm comes from a municipal or high up hierarchy, which tells you this and this happened, yeah? and you are expecting this and this. If this is not working, there should be a backup plan that, for example, the director of an emergency department or the director of a hospital can implement uh, the emergency plan. But that's also always a little bit tricky, especially in a big in, in, in a big, in bigger community, because, well, I might I tend to tend to see uh, on the television and I see oh, a, uh, uh, um, a house crashed after, for example, a gas explosion. Well, it was a five-story house, maybe 30 people in there. But I don't know how many people are actually in there because I don't have a report. And I'm, a, I'm, in, a, I'm in a city with maybe m five major hospitals. So I don't know, will I get 30 patients? Will I get more? Will I only get three patients? So I can activate my plans, but I don't know which, which level because there should be on different levels and if it's necessary. But as a fail-safe, yeah, we also have this. Um, the head of the emergency department and the senior physician can always activate the emergency plans. But ideally, it should come with an order from higher above. above. Then we need to establish a command structure that's actually an incident command 
who will lead and with what, which structure at the emergency department. And parallel, which will take more time, we need a command structure at the hospital, which normally will be a, 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 <coughs> a command staff. And on municipal level above, there will also be a command staff. But that takes up to some hours to be established. And then we have to call in all additional staff that we need. And there is an important thing, as many as needed, as few as possible. In my department, for example, we have 30 physicians and 80 to 90 um, nurses. If all of them came in at once, we wouldn't have place to work, yeah? even with, sur with surge. And the problem is, who would work the day, uh, the day after this? So you have to have a plan whom to call in. And you sh it's, it's no good to call in too many people. You need additional treatment capacities, that's mainly room and equipment. You need security, so for us, in if we call in uh, a mass, ca mass casualty plan, level two is it is actually, there will be, the security will be beefed up a lot. We need to establish, we should have planned it, the patient flaw, flow, and we should guarantee that we have the supplies for a longer start, and that's the reason why we didn't call in all the stuff, the release, the relief stuff. So on the pictures you see, for example, that's a schematic of the general hospital above, yeah, and all the possible in, 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 in ingress point entry points, and all those have to be closed, guarded, or open and guarded and viewed. What I did leave out until now was the elephant in the room is of course a hospital in a major uh, in in, in a, ma a major armed conflict, and that's for two reasons. First of all. I'm not an expert on this, and imaginable. And the second one is linked to me not being an expert, is that we in Middle Europe stopped planning this actually 30 years ago after the end of the Cold War. So we can restart it, but it needs a lot of planning, and the planning is worthless without, uh, without, without training. And that's the reason we won't do it for a long time, because still it's not our most important scenario. Godspeed. Another thing is, for the patient flow, we need the triage. And I know triage has been mentioned a lot during the COVID pandemic. And irresponsive what normally can, comes through in the, in, in, in the media, it's not to decide who, which people don't get treatment. Actually, triage is for processing and decide which people need treatment first. And of course, if I don't have enough resources, then I might have might to say which one of those who need the treatment first has better chances. But that's not the principle. The principle is identifying people who need treatment quicker. And for this, because we, are, we, we have easy, e easy management systems, and one of them is, for example, the start, the simple triage and rapid treatment, uh, which actually is, can be done by medics, but in the hospital we do it. We do it at the incident side by the medics, and we do it again at the hospital. First of all, because the patient uh, situation might have changed, and secondly, because in a major incident, not all patients, and maybe only the minor minority of patients, will, ca will be brought to us by the ambulances. There will be a lot of walk-ins with taxis brought in by relatives, and they have to be triaged. And all the other patients who come to us, for example, because of the chest pain, they also have to, to be triaged, because we have to decide for the overall uh, flow in of patients which patient needs treatment first, not only those from the, tr uh, from the mass casualty in, uh, incident. So quickly, last two slides, it's the challenges. Challenges, is in my experience, is training, especially in countries like Austria, where we have been blessed with very, very few incidents. Uh, um, training is time and money consuming, and that's the reason why we do it, but we do not do it efficiently enough in my in most in, in most hospitals. Secondly, patients. I've spoke about that. The overflow by walk-in patients. When trainings, we mainly we train am ambulances, bring us all the patients, and we have to contact with the ambulances. We know there are 20 ambulances out there, but that's not the reality. Even if even uh, in all the incidents which have been reported in the last years, for example, the Boston bombing very large part of patients has been brought in by taxis, by relatives. They came in by car themselves. And where did they go? To either the hospital they know or the next hospital. The problem is, 
Um, maybe another hospital which is which is far away is the better hospital because it's tertiary care center or has not that many patients, so, so more uh, more treatment capacities. But we can't send them away. We have to cope with that. The infrastructure, emergency generators, as I told you, they run out of fuel and they have to be refueled. So of course, if hospitals have a very high priority, but in a blackout or in a scenario with chaos, there might not be enough uh, uh, infrastructure to bring the, fu the fuel to us. And of course, if the hospital itself is damaged, either due to an earthquake or terrorism or of war, that aggravates the whole situation. And the staff. If there is a mass casualty with, for example, 30, uh, 30 in injured pe people, I know at my hospital and most hospitals, we will get more staff than we need, even without activation. But what if a whole area is, is, uh, is inflicted? Um, will they come? They might not be able to come because there's no pu pu uh, public transport. There might be security issues at home. There might not be water, water and electricity at home. There might be not be food at home. So will they come if they leave their family behind? M maybe not. And that's the reason, for example, the why I, I was asked for it. I have emergency toolings to ease my mind a little bit. So in summary, disaster and mass casualty management is a core duty of hospitals. Many, uh, many employees of hospitals don't know it. So check at your hospital, go to your intranet, go you to your boss and say, what's our plan? It should be readable. And what's my position in there? Yeah? And the degree of preparation depends on the legal requirements and the real and presumed hazards and risks. So of course, we could train for a um, fully armed conflict in, in Vienna now. But it would take resources away from the risks which are much higher and much more probable on the list and on the resources that you have. And hospitals are not no, no fortresses alone on the field. They are part of a community uh, disaster management system. Thanks. Well, Alexander, thanks a lot. This really gives us a background um, information of how things can run and also gives us a little bit of reality that we cannot prepare for everything. I think this is something that we always hope for that uh, we can prepare, but that sometimes we seem to, uh, seem to have to improvise to a certain degree, but there still needs to be planning. Um, for me, one, one question is you, you mentioned this issue of um, electricity. What about the issue of communication though? In the hospital or uh, outside? I, I would say both. That's a big, big, big. Uh, outside hospital, we need we need the communication. We need two points of communication. We need the communication, of course, with ambulance service and, for example, with municipal le leadership. Um, for this, all the hospitals have or should have more uh, ways of communication. So, landline, telephone, uh, mobile telephone, um, uh, direct communication devices. Um, they should be equipped with that. A big problem, of course, is how do we activate our staff if communication fails? So without cellular connection, um, we have a backup, which is email. So well, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't rely on that. Um, if that happens, uh, our only way would be that the people realize something happened and some will come in. But of course, if the whole communication collapses, um, the probability that the whole area, whole city is inflicted highly, is big, and so many, many, many of our workers won't be able to come in. It's a problem, of course. And the communication in a hospital is also a big problem, uh, especially in such a large hospital and at, as our hospital, the General Hospital, a, a large hospital where we don't have a functioning mobile, um, mobile phone system. So um, we have to try to work around with it. And in the worst case scenario, we have to designate employees and say, you're going to go running around, you're going to the OP uh, emergency department, you're going to the operating theater, and you tell them that and that, and you bring me back the information. The good old school. Mm -hmm. But of course, even that you have to train. Yeah. I mean, um, please. So uh, we we also received an, uh, just received another question concerning um, evacuation, especially basically, which is what are your thoughts on evacuation in hospitals, and what is the most urgent and significant thing to do? So, <laughs> evacuation of of hospitals is. Um, a slippery road, of course, because you actually you can in a big hospital you can and if in a big hospital and if you have time pressure you can 
actually only lose because um, it's a logistic nightmare. So what you do is you try to evacu evacuate only if it's really possible. That's the reason why um, larger hospitals tend to have their own fire department yeah, to contain uh, fires, for example. But it might happen. It happened. It happened in af after after uh, after Katr after Katr after Katrina, for example. Yeah, they had to evacuate big hospitals. Um, what is the most important thing to do? First of all, to be sure that it has to be done. Yeah. Uh, secondly, um, you should have a plan, hopefully. Uh, organize where to bring the patients, yeah, because we don't have enough room outside the hospital to s store them. And then you have to do a triage, which patients need transport first. It might depend on the hazard. If the fire is in Tower A, well, then you have to, you have to evacuate Tower A. But also which patients um, you can bring just to an uh, to assembly area, and which has to go to them. But it's a, that's something where really you need to have a plan for that. Training might be difficult. You can evacuate one ward, one floor. You won't evacuate a fully working hospital. Yeah, that's a hazard. But that's something where you really have to plan. And so I have to say, I'm only the part of a team where we plan emergency on disaster relief. I'm My responsibility is to represent the emergency department, which of course is a very important thing here. And I'm participating in the plan for the whole hospital. But thankfully, we have a staff cell um, above me, which has to plan these events. Well, thanks. I think I just want to add one thing, because I had the chance at one point to visit a simulation hospital in Styria, as a matter of fact, in Eisenerz. I don't know if you know the center, but um, it's incredible that uh, they actually are able to simulate even fires, evacuations. Um, it's a complete fully equipped hospital, but which is not for patients, but which is actually really only for training purposes and where such uh, scenarios can be simulated. It's being used by many other countries as well. So this is just something I want to add here. Um, I know a uh, simulation hospital Eisenerz and I would be very keen to go there once and have a training, uh, but I haven't, haven't been that lucky. I will probably organize. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> okay, I think uh, we have a few more questions and a few more minutes maybe that we can use them for uh, some discussion. So, uh, again, maybe some information for you out there. Um, yes, this webinar is being recorded. Um, you will be able to see the recorded versions. We'll divide it into different chunks uh, on the different topics. Uh, please, of course, uh, let others know. We think this is a very important topic. And, um, yeah, maybe there's some more questions coming in. Yes, there are some more, uh, but as we still want to through sonography, I finally want to direct one <laughs> question to you, which is concerning, uh, concerning sonography. And uh, basically it is whether you would uh, be able to recommend any portable uh, ultrasound device, um, especially for field work during war or in crisis. Yeah, I think this is a really good question. Um, I'm... I probably wouldn't recommend a certain brand here because I think the first of all the whole field is evolving so quickly and uh, the scanners are coming up. But maybe I'll just give you a little bit um, uh, thoughts. I mean, the first thing is the battery life, which is important because if you're out in the field, um, you don't have the chance to recharge the systems, and some of these systems unfortunately don't have an extremely long battery life. So it depends on where you're going to use it. If you are in some form of a hospital where you have access to energy, then um, you can use many of these devices. Um, some of them uh, transmit the ultrasound signal via Bluetooth or wireless to a device such as a mobile phone. Others have a connector to a, a tablet or so. So uh, in principle, I would say it doesn't really make a much of a difference of which system you use. But definitely, you should use a system which has a relatively long battery life if you're somewhere out in the field. Um, if you talk about the potential applications, yes, definitely it has a role. Probably not so much in the paracute situation where you have, uh, you know, a very critical situation where you need to, uh, obviously, for example, compress a vessel or an artery. This is not uh, the indication, but um, it does help you, especially in the second phase when you bring patients in where you want to make a little bit more diagnosis. So, yes, uh, I am aware that some of the military personnel and some armies are already using this device uh, and that uh, this is certainly something that I think has a, has a bright future. Um, there was another question I saw later, uh, so earlier, uh, with respect to how should you cover a probe um, if you are in the field. Um, 
to be honest, I would not be afraid or I don't really think it is necessary to c cover the probe at all because if you're in an emergency situation, uh, you will probably not have a cover with you and you will probably not be able to really work under sterile conditions anyway. If you want to clean it, I would say you can even clean it with normal water. As we heard, you might even want to use mineral water. If you have some antiseptic, it might harm a little bit, of course, the probe. There are certain uh, antiseptics you can use and which are recommended. You'd have to talk with the vendor of your system. But um, with respect to covers, I think that uh, this is probably in an emergency situation that something that you would probably not use unless you work in a controlled setting where you have condoms in place where you can put a gel inside and then the probe inside. So that would be my answer to this question. Um, Katrin, do you have anything to say? <laughs> well, I have anything to say. Actually, um, not that much at this point anymore. Yeah. Um, just one remark. Again, many thanks for the questions. I know there are still some unanswered, uh, but we thank you a lot for your contribution. And of course, we will try to work them up in some way. Yeah. Um, yes. To thank all the speakers for participating. Uh, this is on very short notice. Uh, we simply planned this webinar, uh, I think uh, only 14 days ago we came up with the idea and we managed to get top-notch speakers from all different areas and I do hope that you got something out of this. I do hope you will stay safe. I do hope that we will not have to use everything we've learned here and especially that uh, some conflicts uh, will end soon uh, and that uh, you and your families and everyone will be well. So again, thanks to you, thanks to the speakers, thanks to the technical personnel and the people in the background who did a tremendous job. And we do hope that we will see you uh, at a later time in one of these or other webinars to this or maybe other topics. Thanks again. Also many thanks uh, to Apex film team who is supporting us pro bono as well, and uh, not only the speakers. Um, and also Kraft Maga Global, Made Uni Wien. Um, yes. And uh, just to mention one thing, because there's still a lot of questions coming in. Um, if you're interested in first aid topics, we can also recommend um, uh, Ben Tarr's uh, podcast. It is the response podcast, der Berufsrettung Rettung Wien. So it is in Austrian, but uh, you might from, uh, find some valuable insights there as well. <laughs>